Okay, welcome at the Symposium of AI. That's the first one ever that we are doing like this, and especially the one that connects with architecture. Not so many of them you can find. Thank you very much all for coming. I think we have some of the people coming later and some of the people mistaking the room and being there waiting for us. But thank you everyone for coming here. And the most important is that we're going to have two hosts and some of the people with the program that Manuel will update you for. Welcome on stage, Manuel Mofidian and Paul Lensing. Nice to meet you. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this symposium. Uh, it's part of a seminar at Technical University of Vienna. Um, we have it thanks to several persons. One person is uh, Professor Dietmar Wiegand, um, who contacted me uh, some months ago via uh, um, a friend that both of us had, and he told me about Maria, who was starting to work uh, in his unit at the department, and she's an architect and entrepreneur, and also involved in AI, and she wanted to do something interesting for students. So we uh, planned this seminar and had a lot of interest from our students, which are here, and uh, it went over some uh, months, and we, I think we had a lot of cool results. We're still in some works. And part of this seminar, it's really also accredited, so it will count as ECTS points, is this symposium. And we have some guests which are online and present here, and we will have a panel discussion, and we're happy to stream to the whole world. We wrote down, um, we have um, visitors looking to us from Shenzhen, Dnipro, Dnipro in Ukraine, London, from Belgrade, from Paris, Miami. So hello to all of you. We all think AI is an important topic we should talk about, especially in these times. So um, let's discuss. Let's open an, a scientific dialogue. I don't know everything about AI. Maria doesn't. We all try to learn. So let's start with the symposium. Thank you. From my side, I would like to point out some opening words on behalf of Dietmar, who's today on sick leave. So he has this old-fashioned sickness called, I think, what do you call it? I forgot already. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I'm representing actually a former colleague of yours. So I studied architecture from 2000 till I think 2012 or what it was uh, and started my career um, not as an architect in real estate. So I'm today representing the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors, which is an English, uh, British, very honorable circle of elderly men and women uh, who want to survey real estate. What they have not understood so far is that AI is going, going to completely change our business in real estate. And the reason I'm here today is I would like to join you on this journey, uh, on this very, very, very important starting point, which we all going to experience today. Because when I started, and I just told her, I was doing my first AutoCAD drawing in 1996, uh, six, uh, 96 years, yeah, so not that old. And I was completely impressed by the fact that I do not have to draw two lines to a corner. It was done automatically. Then in 2005, I had my first game on Grasshopper, and I was really impressed. Then I stopped my career in architecture, and I went back to Excel sheets, which still do not work the way they should. Yeah? So in a nutshell, today is a very, very important day for the university because it's a starting point. I'm an AI, I became an AI nerd in the last year, so prompting is the new coding, and uh, please take us on the journey. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. I think we continue also with the introduction of the uh, seminar itself. You wanted to say a couple of words about it, or you want to give me the word completely there? Okay, perfect. So for everybody who are here not part of the seminar that was happening, I want to give you words what was actually starting point and uh, what initiated this symposium. The seminar took place in the beginning. The idea was to experience what is AI just in architecture. But later we decided inside our institute that it's way much more interesting to discover what it can do also beyond and how those things can be applied back to architecture or related to architecture. And with our students, we had 20 second, uh, 22 uh, students at our seminar with so interesting topics, which even I didn't expect that we will go into such a depth of all those research 
and um, interesting investigation. And today you will see three of them that we decided will cover very nicely uh, some of the topics of architecture and one of the topics will be not architectural, but it will be interesting for you, for sure. You will see. And we will have um, a keynote speaker, Patrick Schumacher from Zaha Hadid Architect. He will join us online and he will explain his journey through uh, digital architecture design, through the metaverse and through AI that he was working in his office that he was working by himself, that he was doing a lot with the students. And later we will have a very nice panel of specialists that will cover different topics in real estate, architecture and design. So guys, just enjoy, relax and get ready to pick your brain a little bit. And we are welcoming on stage our first presenter, which will be Robin Bohtansky with his presentation about stable diffusion. And for somebody of you who doesn't know a stable diffusion, this is a very interesting model that is behind most of the visual uh, AIs that we are working with. And now be ready to actually switch on your brain on full. Welcome, Bogdan. Oh, Robin, sorry. Yeah. Okay, so since I has um, since AI has become more and more important, I was thinking how can I as an ongoing architect or an architectural student use AI to increase my workflow. And for that I dived into the topic of AI and I f found for me was most interesting the process of visualization using AI. And then I discovered, as you have heard before, that most of the tools that um, cover visualization with AI often run based on stable diffusion. So what is stable diffusion actually? So stable diffusion is an open source model that um, creates, pro uh, creates images based on prompts. Um, and how can we as a regular person use stable diffusion now? So how can we use the code that's behind stable diffusion? For that perfect, there is the automatic 11.11 web user interface. You can see a little screenshot of it right there. And this gives us a platform to interact with the artificial intelligence without needing to code. Um, stable diffusion is a big general model that can almost create every output based on your prompts. But you can also train models, it's called fine-tuning, on specific tasks. For example, you can train a model on interior design, or you can train a model on a specific architectural style, or you can train a model on exterior design, creating a model that is spe specialized on this task and will give you better output. So for my experiments, I always used models that are trained on the tasks that I wanted to perform. So how does this all work now? We have three basic inputs. So we have our prompt. That is a text description of what we want to generate. Then we have extensions. Those are add-ons that you can install in, within the automatic 11.11 and work together with your prompt. And we have, of course, the rendering settings. And all of those three components are sent to the fine-tuned model and the model generates an output for you based on that. So first of all, I want to talk a little bit about ControlNet. This is one of the most important extensions for stable diffusion in terms of architecture. Because ControlNet gives you, as an architect, the ability to not only use a prompt to generate an image, but also use visual input to gain a generated output. So, how does this work? Um, ControlNet uses different methods of translating your input into an, out, uh, into an image that the AI understands. So the first method, for example, is Kenny. Um, you can see I took a picture of a 3D model from Archicad, and Kenny draws the outlines of this building, and the AI understands these outlines and works based on, on this structure. Then the second one is depth, so it analyzes your picture and draws a depth map of your picture, and the AI can work with that. 
And the third one, which is quite special, especially for interior design, is segmentation. In this method, the AI gives each object in your picture or each object category, for example, paintings on the wall or a couch, it's very unique own color, so the AI understands what object is placed at what position in your picture. So to start with my experiments, first of all, I gave the AI a simple input, which was just the 3D model of a architecture project I did and used the control net Kenny to um, create, the, uh, to draw the outlines of the building. And then I typed in a simple prompt, which contained nighttime, um, wooden facade, steel frame. And you can see the AI came up with quite a nice rendering just with this little information, but also having the structure of the, what the building should look like through control net. A second thing is the negative prompt. So this is a way of telling the AI what it's not supposed to do. So you write something like low resolution or normal quality or cropped and blurry. So in a second experiment, I tried out going even further using a reference image. Because in ControlNet, you also have the option to use references and the AI analyzes those reference images and it detects the style and the theme of the, the setting and applies it to your rendering. So as you can see, the AI managed to catch the, the theme of the surrounding as well as the um, wooden texture of the building and applied it to my rendering, which was turned out quite nice. And also I kept the prompt quite short here in order to give the reference image more power in this case. In a second, um, in a second experiment, I tried out changing this reference image to the National Gallery of Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. And as you can see, the AI noticed the steel frame and this change of the background to an urban setting and applied it to my image also quite well. In the next step, I want to talk a little bit about segmentation. So, as you can see, I took this picture of this room and let the AI do the segmentation for me. So detecting each object category, for example, the pictures, they are, um, the pictures on the wall, they are red, the couch is um, colored blue, and every object has its unique color. And then I gave the AI also a reference image to refurnish my room based on this reference image. So as you can see, all the objects, they are still in the same place, so you can definitely recognize the room, but the whole scene, the whole theme of the scene has changed. In a second step, I wanted to see, okay, as an architect, we often don't have a image because we are still in the design process, so I wanted to see how this process works on a simple rendering. So I did the segmentation again. In this, time, in this step, I also gave the AI another control map, so the outlines of the room, in order to have even more guidelines to work with, and a simple prompt, and it came up with quite a cinematic rendering as well. And in a further step, I also applied a reference image here, and as you can see, it managed to apply the reference to my, um, to my scene. So I was thinking, okay, now I was just basically um, creating cinematic output from something that was already there, but can I also furnish a room using segmentation? So I took this picture of an empty room, did the segmentation of it. As you can see, we only have the, the door, the curtains, the floor, and the wall, but there is no furniture in it. And then I looked up the specific color for the object categories that I have to place in order for the AI to detect which object it has to place at specific spots. So I placed a sofa, a painting, a plant, and a plant pot with its very unique object color and gave the AI the original image as reference 
in order to give me a rendering. And as you can see, it's still the same room, but the AI managed to place my object at the exact spot using my prompts for the description of what the object should look like. As a last step, I wanted to see, okay, sometimes you have not as much graphic power and the rendering process takes quite long. So the image quality uh, sometimes isn't as good as you want it to be. So for example, I have this picture. It turned out quite well, but I wasn't quite pleased by the image quality. And I was also missing on some, um, some objects that would make the scene more, more cinematic. So I was using the Photoshop tool. I don't know if, has any of you used the generative fill tool on Photoshop already? I think most of the architects have. So basically, um, it's a tool where you mark a certain area in a picture, you type in a prompt, and it places a specific object that you typed in only in this area of the picture. So I did this, and I also used the upscaling method and managed to receive a quite nice cinematic picture um, rendering in a high resolution out of that. Yeah. So now I have shown a couple of ways to interact with stable diffusion and artificial intelligence besides just using prompts. Because I can definitely say stable diffusion and AI renderings are super powerful in terms of architecture. It can save us so much time. Instead of spending hours on one visual output, you can now try out many different styles in just a couple of minutes. But as always, communication is key. And that's also how I want to end this presentation because it's important what information you are able to give the AI, but not only prompts, also visual information, and maybe in the future other ways of interacting through further extensions, and then you will be able to receive, receive incredible outcome with it. Thank you. Thank you, Robin, very much. It was an amazing presentation, and I think we've all seen what AI can do. The point here is that can it actually understand what it's doing? Because, you know, there is a saying. So once AI decided to create a house, it created a house, a virtual house, and then this virtual house had a virtual roof leaking. And the question was why? It's because AI didn't understand the concept of cloud storage. So we, we don't know that it doesn't understand any concepts what it's doing. We have to really navigate it and we have to really show it what it should do. And that's, that's the language that we should learn with you if we want to use it. Thank you again for the presentation. And I would like to introduce next presentation, which will be a presentation about biases. And we need to find our next speaker. Please welcome on stage Shana Ansari. A little few words about this experiment. This is probably the only non-architectural presentation that you're going to see today and to listen today, but the relevance of it is very high because we can also see that AI is learning based on the data that we have put there, put out in the internet, and we as a human influence it very much. And until up to which extent it can take decisions by itself, up to which extent it can stay non-biased and it can be ethically correct or morally correct. That's something that has to be investigated really, really in depth. And here we have a presentation and Shana, please, the stage is yours. Oh, hi everyone. Um, so today's age, artificial intelligence has become more and more involved into our daily lives as well as a big part in our future. So it's important to acknowledge that it reflects and mirrors kind of our whole society because it's learning from our database, it's learning our characteristics, our mindsets, and therefore also our biases. And today I would like to go further into detail into this matter by addressing the question, how do the gender biases observed in AI-generated images relate to the perceptions of individuals? 
So I would firstly be talking briefly about the theoretical research regarding that matter, then explaining the experimental research I've conducted, which is still ongoing, and lastly talk about the results. So the theoretical research on gender biases regarding um, generative images and AI is that these programs work and operate in really similar ways. The main difference is how their, their art style and how well the pictures turn out. However, regarding this matter, they do act on similar um, ways. And the reasons for these biases that are in fact present would be lack of diversity or representation, or them putting more value into quantity than quality, which doesn't always mean that it's more representative or diverse. It could also mean that it's the same thing over and over again. And another reason would be also incomplete or inaccurate data or the reinforcement of biases, for example, through positive feedback that is um, already on existing biases and therefore amplifying those. Um, so for my experimental research, I focus on mainly three things, the prompt generation, the image creation, and the participant's description, which I will further explain now. So first, I based up a set of um, 20 prompts, which were regarding the gender matter in different areas, whether it be um, in the working field, hobbies, emotionally, or, the, or other stereotypical scenarios. And I gave those prompts to the AI to generate 20 images for each one of those prompts. Um, you can see the prompts on the rise. And then I also interviewed um, participants with the same prompts and asked them to describe to me what they would, what image would pop up in their minds when they saw these prompts. And it's important to note that they didn't know what the main goal of this experiment was, so they didn't know it's a gender thing. I just wanted to see what kind of description they would deliver to me. So I will be going through the, um, I will be going through the main um, prompts now um, and explain. In the background, you can see one picture I chose out of the 20 that represents the result of the AI, and then you can see the AI results compared to the participants. There were some where it was fairly similar, but also a few, for example, in this case where it wasn't. Um, here you can see that most participants did, in fact, imagine a father and, as a parent. And um, for the next one, however, it was fairly similar for a happy couple. People did imagine um, two genders, um, a man and a woman. A newlywed couple eating their wedding cake was also fairly similar. Then we have a successful business person holding a presentation, which was, in fact, a bit different, as you can see. We have a police officer with their dog on duty that is also fairly similar. It's also important to know that during these interviews, people didn't outright say the gender. Sometimes I had to look for like keywords, whether it be pronouns or other descriptions. Um, here we have a model on the runway, which is also pretty similar. An elderly baking cookies. Two people preparing a meal together. Here people had different perceptions of that. Sometimes people imagined friends together, a couple. Or, so therefore, the outcomes are different here as well. Here we have three medalists in the gymnastics standing on a podium and receiving their medals. Also quite different. Um, here we have a group of friends enjoying a football match on their couch at home, which is fairly similar. Um, a person at the movies shedding a tear. And I think for this one, I, the answer I got the most would have been me, which is relatable. So you have to also keep in mind that people imagine themselves in these kind of scenarios, and it would be... Um, beneficial at the end of the experiment to have a fair amount of men and women um, interviewed. So here we have a person in a professional attire giving a public speech, also fairly similar, an athlete on a field, a group of friends dancing in the club, um, a happy family, the outcome differed here a little bit, two people enjoying a romantic dinner at a restaurant, a head chef dicing some onions on the cutting board, a child holding a doll, which was also a bit different. And the last two interested me the most. I will come to that later, though. A professor teaching a university class and an elementary teacher holding a pencil. So in my theoretical research, I came up with one study that did um, a similar thing to mine, which and the results were similar as well. So they kind of wanted AI to generate um, a judge, which is the 3% of the time a female judge and the other 97% of the time a male judge. And they did not um, compare that to participants or interviewed other people, but they did compare it to reality and facts and stats. And it showed that um, 
even though it was about 3% in the US, it was about 34% um, female judges at that time. And I feel like this is kind of the same outcome here as well, because this is, these are both the professor as well as the elementary teacher are both teaching positions. However, we want to associate more with a woman and one more with a man. And in this case, um, the outcome to reality was also far off. For example, for this case, it would have been about 30 to 40% in real life. Um, and as you can see, the participants are closer on, but comparing it to AI, there's a large gap. And for the elementary teacher holding a pencil, um, the male teachers would have been about 15% in real life. So it's also showing these biases that are already present in AI. And I think it's also important to note how these may solidify or um, implement these already existing stereotypes that people already have and further exaggerate those. So as you can see, um, there were a lot of similarities in the perception of the AI as well as the people. However, there were, I would like to say, quite a few that did have a different outcome. And um, I think it's important to um, have a realistic measurement form for reality to compare to and see how far it is off or how close it is. And it's vital to talk about these biases because when they are this far off from reality, they can further implement or solidify the already existing um, stereotypes in our society. And it does make a big societal impact. So I think we should talk and acknowledge um, these biases and have these ethical dis discussions about how to mitigate these biases in the future of AI. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. I think it's a very good uh, think point so that we can concentrate. Is it actually like a reflection of our own thoughts? Is it a reflection of the real world, which we saw that it's not always happening in this way? And uh, something to think about which type of traces are we leaving in the internet? Because as you know, most of the people when AI appeared and when generation of images started to be accessible by everyone, what they all started to generate in 90% of cases, that was pretty beautiful female bodies. Even though all the internet is completely full with that, still human being stays the human being and we have to work on ourselves before we work on AI because it's a good mirror. Okay, now we have our next presentation. And uh, on our next presentation, we will speak about, our, back to architecture, we will speak about possibilities of AI to work with the floor plans. Because in most of the cases, we have a lot of very nice possibility to generate beautiful uh, visualizations. We can have possibilities to generate nice concepts. But what do we do with the drawings? What do we do with the floor plans? And talking about real estate development, that's one of the questions that is very undiscovered and working less, 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 worked very less in, in the society. Now we're going to the presentation of um, Wolf Roland, the possibilities of AI enhanced floor plan design in residential projects. Please welcome. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, today I will be talking, as already announced, about the possibilities of AI-enhanced floor plan design in residential projects, or um, more understandable, can AI replace architects? For that, I was looking into the uh, most um, interesting software on this field, um, where you really can do floor plan design, or at least uh, do some um, architectural um, background, inf get some background information, um, and I uh, decided to analyze it in certain topics. Uh, at first, uh, there is the project development, then also site-based analytics, space allocation, plan creation, and also quantity survey. I started off uh, with uh, ChatGPT, which is pretty much known to everyone here, I guess, um, and. For that, I uh, created the prompt, imagine you're a developer of an apartment building in the city of Vienna, um, and you're allowed to build a four-story building, and I gave some background information, and ChatGPT instantly uh, gave me uh, this answer here on the left. Um, 
that I have to consider one, two, three bedroom apartments and different sizes of them. ChatGPT also gave me uh, information about additional features which uh, the um, building should have. Uh, and um, furthermore explained that I should remember that the actual ratio of the size of the apartments and specific requirements um, con uh, are based on the location of the building, of, uh, based on cost, budgets, and um, the market. So um, I was pretty impressed that it already uh, lines out uh, a background information which uh, with you can work with very well. What uh, I found very fascinating was also when I changed the uh, units from metric units to imperial units, ChatGPT uh, gave different answers and um, the sizes of departments uh, got bigger by more than 20%, even though it's still in Vienna and the same cultural background. So that's also a thing you have to keep in mind that every information you type in will result in a different output and you also uh, always have to think about what you're getting and not uh, blindly trust the AI. After that, I uh, wanted to really start uh, to get into floor plan design and uh, looked it up. The first software uh, which showed up on Google is Make It AI, which sounded pretty promising. Uh, as you only have to put in the basic information, you only had to uh, put in that you wanted a, uh, a floor plan with two bedrooms, uh, one bathroom, and um, it creates you uh, four different images instantly. Um, but, yeah, I think we all know how much of a real world uh, project this is gonna be, and um, yeah, I wasn't that satisfied with the result. After that, I said, okay, let's uh, start looking uh, deeper, uh, dig, dig in deeper. And I was looking at Planner 5D, uh, which is a software uh, online where you, uh, which can really generate uh, floor plans, but which can um, uh, use your floor plans. And uh, also you can furnish the apartment and it tells you the prices. And uh, so you have an overview of what your project will cost. Uh, which was very interesting, but also, uh, sadly, there's only the cost for the um, floor, for the ceiling, for, and for the furniture, and no cost of the building itself. So it's also not that good. And I was really uh, unsatisfied. I said, okay, um, is there nothing we can do about it? Uh, is there no software yet? And um, then I stumbled across a software uh, from a Viennese architecture company, which is Eva Rapid Layouting. And Eva um, is pretty cool because it uh, doesn't work on the smallest scale, but on the biggest scale possible. Um, you have to load up your site and uh, it will uh, already generate the building, the, the outlines of it. And you can dig in deeper by um, looking at the different um, layouts of the, of the flats. Um, it is not possible for that software to design whole flats but it's uh, possible to see the allocations of the, uh, each rooms and uh, the interaction between the rooms, um, which was uh, really fascinating because it's working on such a uh, fast time and also um, you only need to, but you need to have AutoCAD, uh, so you have to have a background and know what you're doing, but it will tell you this is a way you can do it, and it's really generative. If you change one line, it will instantly change the whole layout of the building. For uh, the design of the flats itself, I um, saw Plan Finder, um, which is also a feature, uh, a tool, uh, where uh, you can uh, upload your drawing, or uh, better to say, it's working on your computer. If you have Rhino, if you're a professional architect, um, you can just draw the outlines of the flat, which uh, was created by, uh, for example, um, Eva before. And then you can, by simply um, using um, information uh, and uh, decide like um, that you uh, want one bathroom, one bedroom, um, and uh, Plan Finder then is uh, giving you the output of the uh, layout, the layout of the uh, flat, and also uh, varies the flat layout uh, according to your needs. And um, as you can see here, 
uh, if after five minutes you have created a whole floor level and also have it in 3D. So you can really work with it. Of course, there is fine tuning uh, which you have to think about later on, but you have something to work with, uh, which is pretty fascinating as uh, far as the level uh, is uh, now. And um, there are also some other tools uh, which uh, try to um, combine these two features and which don't need to uh, work with uh, software based on your computer, uh, like Architectures, which is a software from Spain, uh, where you uh, could upload uh, your site plan. And uh, it is a web-based interf uh, web interface uh, where you can um, create the whole building um, by uh, working with uh, these different uh, settings here, and you can really choose a lot. You can, uh, and you have to uh, be sure what your building should look like. You have to be sure if you want one hallway, two hallways, you have to uh, know the, uh, the outline, and also have to know the, um, the laws there to, to build it accordingly to the standard. But if you know that, and if you know um, how to put it into the software, you can achieve uh, pretty big, uh, good results in nearly no time, and um, also have a 3D model to download and to work with later on. And the, the last software I um, was evaluating was Spatial AI, AI, which was trying to combine all of those features I just uh, mentioned. And um, there, if you uh, work with the, the layout, you can set different uh, types of how the the buildings should be allocated on the side, and uh, also, uh, not even uh, it's not even focused on residential buildings. You can also combine these buildings by saying, okay, this one, this part should be office spacious, this part should be residential, this part should be a hotel, and uh, only with a few clicks, you can really uh, go dig deeper in and uh, have uh, nearly a whole pro uh, project layouted in only a few minutes um, and have a solid basis to work on for the more. As you can see, they're all, uh, also testing some methods to uh, create the, the uh, proper lighting environment so uh, the whole building really works. Uh, but it's still in the beta phases, so uh, always keep in mind that you have to think about what results you're getting. And this leads to my feedback. and. Um, as you can see here, um, the software, which is pretty easy to use, like Make It, Planner 5D, which everyone can use, only provides a limited um, information for you. And software, which uh, is uh, good, which, which does uh, do a lot of stuff and uh, which you can use as an architect, really does a good job and gives you a solid basis. So for me as an architect and um, as I would uh, tell any architect who would ask me uh, questions about AI, I uh, have to say that if you know what you're doing, if you know what you're dealing with, AI can be such a great tool. AI can be the basis of, of the uh, architecture you're making, but you also always have to keep in mind that AI can't replace you for now. Thank you. Thank you very much for a great presentation. I think you've seen also now a very nice slice of a different type of AI that can be used in architecture. Of course, there are other applications that are used on different stages for different purposes. Most of them are still based on stable diffusion and they work with similar models. But if you would like to choose something to try and to work with, you have a very nice already layout for yourself done by our amazing students. Thank you very much for the first part. Now we invite you for a coffee break and afterwards we will have a lecture of Patrick Schumacher and please enjoy warm coffee, tea and some snacks and network of course. Patrick, uh, thank you very much for joining this call and for being able to speak more about AI and architecture because this topic is very important. We've heard earlier today presentations of students talking about which type of tools in AI can be used, how they can be used, which type of things can be used for floor plans, for concept design, for the visualization. And we would like to know from you, uh, as, as a director of a very big company of Zaha Hadid uh, um, Architects, 
how are you implementing it in real life and what is the current status of the most futuristic approaches in architecture with AI? Okay, great. The stage is yours and if you have something to share uh, as a presentation would be great. One second, I first share my face to you for one minute. <laughs> that would be also good. <clears throat> okay, guys. <laughs> Happy to see you. The, the background is one of the AI creations. The first ones with DALI 2 we came up with when DALI 2 came out. It's still, it still, that brought me kind of into it. I heard so much about it when it was developed <clears throat> before with, with Rafik Anadol and Daniel Bologna and Deep Himmelblau, etc. But it wasn't yet convincing for us. And when DALI 2 came out, we we jumped into it and it, we, we're working with that. And now I can show you a few things we've been up to. We obviously, um, we've been using DALI 2, but mostly we've now working with Stable Diffusion and our own uh, training up our own uh, subsidiary net uh, <clears throat> models, let's say, as well as using Midjourney. Um, and sharing the expertise, we're st it's still the beginning. I mean, it's early ideation mostly, but we show you also how you can use it a bit more strategically and a bit of an outlook, um, what what our research, so we have a dedicated research team around AI now, a small team uh, exploring it, exploring the various tools, comparing them and starting to feed into the ideation and, and competition process mostly. So I will, I will talk about that. So we have an eye infection and <coughs> so I'm looking at uh, uh, funny, um, but I want to, uh, yeah, I want to share my screen first. Let's see what, how that works out. It's always, sometimes a bit tricky. Um, <clears throat> wait one second. Do you have access to it? Okay, one, one moment, please. Just have to do it this way. Okay. Okay, so yes, you can see now we can see it. Lights. Perfect. So now the trick is can, will you be able to see slide by slide? So, so you give me some feedback. Now I see all the slides. Still yes. only all the slides, or you see this is the, the only slide, slide, the first one. Only the what? Only the one slide, the first slide. Oh, so that works. Oh, that works. Okay, yes, right, right. So perfect. we can continue like this. So basically, <laughs> you know, I'm the promoter of permatism. It's been a fantastic uh, movement over many years. And there's a dedicated core team which keeps developing, but it hadn't, you know, expanded its audience in the professional world and in schools of architecture is also kind of overtaken by other concerns. But now I see this an unbelievable boost of parametricism, at least in my terms, parametricism 1.0. So that's a thrill, but uh, it falls short on parametricism 2.0, which I also will indicate what, what I mean by this, which I call tectonism plus. Uh, there has been a publication recently, uh, sorry, uh, a few years ago, parametricism 2.0, which means parametricism has to gear up to uh, a more rational process and, and not only integrating engineering logics, that's tectonism, but also focusing on social functionality issues and explaining why we need complex, adaptive, versatile uh, repertoires of <coughs> design and geometry, etc. So, in, yeah, that's the thesis. And uh, just to show you briefly, I mean, I don't show you <laughs> the pr the attempts with DALI 1, etc. They were very crude and things didn't have balance and no prop got proper perspective, no light and shadow. But with DALI 2, you get coherent images, at least when it comes to composition, light and shadow, architecture, vertical, spin, vertical, per perspectival. Uh, uh, horizontal and vertical kind of structured and a lot of richness and creativity in defining uh, new forms. <laughs> so, so uh, and these were all prompted with Zadid uh, in the prompt somehow, Zadid Architects or Parametricism. And uh, so I thought, wow, that's quite unique. We're in a good position. We have so many images out there so we can 
use that as our own repertoire expansion. And uh, but what what I think then when you look, <clears throat> what I realized when Mid Journey and so came on and that uh, hermeticism is kind of pervasive predominant epochal style or what I call the hegemony of hermeticism is exists in the world of AI, if not in the world of architecture or the built environment for sure. And that's, I think, what is quite interesting. And this is just this morning randomly saying architectural created by Midjourney. So you can try the same with DALI 2. It's actually irrelevant. That's what comes out. So I would say about like at least 75% uh, parametricism. Um, <laughs> and that's quite stunning. That's amazing. And it's somehow maybe built in the original <clears throat> I don't know, style of mid-journey, but it's obviously not only an architectural system. So here you zoom into a little bit and it's kind of fascinating what comes out. And even just these images I just showed you popping up, even though DALI 2 there, this is just zooming into the Google search and going scrolling down and picking them up. And, um, and then, yeah, there's a lot of those um, special tutorial and workflow um, uh, for, for architects, etc. with mid-journey they have always parameticism uh, uh, images. So, so that's quite stunning and curious. Um, I mean, that's, that's really a thing. So, and, and yeah, in particular those who, who have, you know, deliberate, uh, let's say headline images for their, for their um, YouTube tutorials, they have these kind of works and that's architecture according to this generation and i think that's very fascinating and it's, it's very beautiful however anyway and we can do go in and of course some of these so we're using I mean, it goes through some of the systems we're using um not only mid journey dali 2 but also uh leonardo when you can pump up your own models and you know we we use it um to generate quick sketches for competitions, ideation, and there's sometimes quite interesting and creative ways of um, solving a mass and breaking up a mass and opening up a mass and embedding it and blending it into, into landscapes. All the themes we've been working on, you don't even have to put them particularly into the, into the, into the prompt. And uh, so this is just recently, and you know, Sometimes we need these renderings super fast because the way competitions are organized now in China, um, you, they create a shortlist of five people, but to get on the shortlist, there's hundreds of people submitting sketches. You have five days and in the end, it's so competitive. Everybody brings in full on rendered full submissions just to get on the shortlist. Compet competitive pressure is kind of mounting crazily. So that's why we resorting to some of the, some of those kind of sketches, saying, "Well, we have to push something out there to get on the shortlist." And, the, and but these are interesting, convincing. You know, this was for con convention, you know, museum, convention center, um, uh, indoor arena complex, uh, several projects. We had to generate four projects <laughs> in five days. Okay, so that's. Uh, all positive and exciting but then you know my book came just out tectonism and for the last actually nearly 15 years parametrism has been much more invested in rigorously you know looking into st things like structural optimization uh, um, <clears throat> shell forms tensile forms and they have a particular logic which is not necessarily easy for an ai to catch up unless you specially train it up uh, as well as, as yes environmental logics uh, sun shading logical sun shading etc parametrically and fabrication logics and that's been the topic of uh, this book it came out in chinese and in english it just came out and this is the world of the new world of tectonism and it's much more has much more versatility expressive richness actually great for architectural work where we have to um, start articulating the built environment in a kind of diverse and rich and semiologically charged way. And for that is a fantastic repertoire. But you can also see that there's, there is more, let's say, degrees of coherence, which a system would have to get right. Some of our buildings, which, <clears throat> which uh, show that the contemporary way you have a structure, it's differentiated. It's not just 
running up the tower undifferentiated like left and right of this tower but uh, you know the, the structure can accumulates density and strengths with the more moments and loads accumulating and then uh, you can open it up and break and open up the corner at the top etc so there's a number of those examples um, <clears throat> and more examples of particular for, you know um, formal logics which are particular to a a, a global the global form terms of structure compression shells tensile structures topology optimized skeletons or other fabrication logic like rule surfaces hot wire cutting etc and um, or compression only shells so when you then go into the ai systems and try to um, recreate that it's a stunning failure and I, again i i've done i've tried it uh, uh, 18 months ago two years ago or whenever it was when dali 2 came out and it was failing and it's still failing this is just this morning with leonardo um you know these bridges don't make sense <laughs> they're absolutely nonsensical there oftentimes there isn't even a crucial element like the bridge itself or this kind of arched foot bridge there's no hangers here there is not so, you know it's 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 really funny i mean uh, here's a, a half bridge so it's it's strange the rationality levels are, are you know the rigor level you still get the perspective right uh whatever whatever object you have <laughs> light and shadow but the object itself is meaning is these I mean, even simpler bridge you know over river with truss structures seems to me easy first glance okay but if you go close there's a lot of noise and irrationality and it forgot the actual uh, surface you can use to cross <laughs> and here this is also a lot of noise and nonsense and it doesn't make structural sense so so that's kind of the, the limitations of how can we deal with it and uh, so you have to really have to train up your own models supplementing um, a big model to get a lot of other richness and detail that's the kind of the, me the main message here for me is to really be upgraded to the contemporary architecture with respect to our ambitions we can't straightforwardly use we can use it in other ways where you make it a sketch diagram but uh, and and give it in give it uh, more pre-designed you know control lines but then of course we lose a lot of the power of that and it becomes more of a rendering machine which is what we can use it for also of course so this was also funny in terms of uh, the prompt here is Zadid Architects uh, exoskeleton high rise building, mixed use parametric with sun shading elements. I mean, this is an insight. These are caricatures of our work. But then, even if you go, and this speaks again to this kind of parametricism, huge parametricism bias in inverted commerce, which I, in principle, enjoy. Uh, here, the next one is Richard Rogers' exoskeleton office tower. And uh, again, they're, qu they're quite organic, way different from Richard Rogers. So this is kind of biased towards the super organic. And some of them are quite bizarre. And then, you know, two of them are quite elegant. We, we could subscribe to it. But it's really funny, this kind of overdrive in terms of organic and fluid with respect to um, the, these, these systems. And again, uh, 200 meter office tower with skeleton structure expressed in the exterior and this is just doesn't make sense okay um now so i will come back to this again later um, but here's the the way we start building uh going through our own image library and which is huge as well as other reference libraries and you know tagging making these kind of specific tags you want to later retrieve and work with when we train up our own models so um, there's typological um, i mean what kind of design you're looking at basically external form etc facade the typology uh, <clears throat> commercial office recreational or etc etc the tectonics is interesting so we have digital timber we have um, robotic hot wire cutting this is you know generates that you could use a ruled surfaces so you can make form work with them or creased curved folding 
3D printing, tessellation. This is not really exhaustive. We're just starting and I haven't kind of critiqued that yet fully. And then uh, what the visual output is anyway. So, so we're bringing in our own reference images to augment these models, to get them to become more useful for more advanced, let's say, architectural ambition, which we, which we bring to the table. So this would be, for instance, uh, and that's the beauty of tectonism. You have not only NURB surface and NURB Maya modeling, but you have actually different geometries, which are specific. For instance, the hot wire cutting, you can do a lot of variety, but it will all be ruled surfaces due to the process. And you can mold make much, you know, like 50 times faster than with a milling uh, machine. Or, you know, what I just mentioned, creased curved folding. Uh, that's where you can do beautiful things with sheet metal. Uh, score, you know, cutting, scoring, and folding robotically, or 3D printing again. But there's stuff, of course, 3D printing itself is, yeah, it's, it can't do anything. You, you, when you print in large and concrete, you have to pay a lot of attention to the layers, and there's only so much you can uh, deviate from the horizontal, and you can, you, there's a certain tectonic uh, rigor to this material. Next thing we're looking at, possibly, you know, uh, working with uh, stress lines, primary and secondary stress lines for, for shell forms, etc., etc. So, so that's an outlook which I wanted to mention. So in terms of ZHA usage, the overview, so we're using a lot of these um, tools. We have the corporate mid journey account. You can see here how many jobs, inverted commas, let's say, searches we've made uh, in each of these, like 7,500. This is already a few years, three months old for 50 plus projects. You can see here that there's a good ratio of usability of something. And uh, Stable Diffusion, we more, because it's a research team, they've done already 10,000 searches uh, for only 10 projects. So we, we, we be more researching and trying out these are not necessarily projects. And then DALI 2. So the majority, I mean, again, it's great. We, and the, the results are so, let's say, plausible in terms of geometry, light, and shadow coherency that you can then quickly model them into Maya and move on with this and use that as a rendering as, and, and involve clients as well. But then you model and have a model and then can that feed that model back in to make further variation or further rendering. So there's this kind of uh, feeding initiation. You can see here we, the team also is kind of looks at how many iterations they have to run to find something they find useful. That took two hours, I mean, to really get something which says, okay, now that's what we're gonna go run with. Then you go to uh, model that quickly. And then um, you bring that model back in to mid journey and generate a lot of variations. Um, um, and and uh, <clears throat> to get this kind of dialectic feed, circular feeding back in, uh, uh, re then remodeling and feeding back in, etc. And then um, this is the kind of stuff we've been generating. And of course, we the ones we selected, we can obviously then also feed back into uh, training up new neural networks. Um, so. And this is where it kind of, this case where you um, bring in an image you've modeled and then just use Midjourney as a rendering machine, right? But it took a long time, seven hours to get this something right. <coughs> so in that, there we will discover stable fusion is, is better. So we have uh, Midjourney for the quick ideation shape developing, uh, it's more conceptual, and you find find interesting solutions, how it kind of, a, 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 how it turns a floor into a ceiling, or how it, how it layers structure, etc. So that, I mean, this image itself is, you know, obviously kind of, there's a lot of nonsense. And of course, you, I know you can now with the parameters, you can, you can kind of control that and dial that back. And this is the uh, stable diffusion where we can, input control nets uh, where we can guide and ch channel the image much more precisely and uh, you know work with more intent but of course then it's less 
creative. So you, I think we, 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 we're not saying stable diffusion is better. There's different horses for different courses, if you like, and part of the design process, we need both open-ended ideation and then uh, selecting and then homing in on something more controlled. So with these control net models, you can see here, you can have different types, uh, uh, the canny edge or the straight line detections, um, et cetera. Do you have this? This is interesting, uh, the semantic segmentation. So you have them kind of color coded where you say, you know, this color is water or this color is sky, this color is fa facade, this color is solid or this one is glass, etc. Then the depth map to give you a sense of foreground, background. You can see with the different inputs, the outcome is quite different. So you, so the form is no longer the correct uh, in the, you know, in everything which is built because that was bleached out. So we need more than one to drive something with more intent. So that's this use of of control nets, um, <clears throat> and. So you can go here in and you use your Rhino model uh, with different materials. So you do the, the, the layer, you use a layer structure and color coded layers for the um, sidewalk pavement, the road, the ceiling, blah, 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 blah. And then when you render out the quick render uh, or you sc screenshot the, the image on, on Rhino, then you get something which can drive with the depth map which stabilizes the shape, you can then get the right areas with the right material, if you like. So that's quite strategic. You can use that color coding layer structure directly to drive and um, um, the rendering materiality. And so, so um, that's what we've done here. And then you can go in also obviously and hand paint it. So you have the screenshots of your Rhino model and then you make quick paintbrush kind of, uh, you know, with the respective colors changes and work into the, uh, into the rendering like this, like instead of Photoshop. <laughs> um, um, so, or you have this possibility where you like something and then you, you make variations for a sub part, which you just block up and leave black, and then it feeds uh, these things in. So, I mean, this is interesting uh, uh, techniques, which make the whole thing slightly a lot more, let's say, structured, where you, where you have uh, fulfilled particular conditions. And this is again, one of those where we, we have, uh, we had a super quick sketch model, but within the, we had to, um, get a photorealistic kind of rendering out in two days, and then you you you, you can use uh, the AI to generate this. I mean that's less exciting, but it's it's highly this sort of automation productivity gains, not uh, where you do something which you could have done anyway much much faster. Less of course, uh, uh, you know, but of course there's enormous creativity boosting potential. Uh, which 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 you know probably more about or everybody knows about, but this is more in the professional context more strategic this, and then you can you can do that iterate these models and get them all rendered out. Okay, um, this whole idea of using sketches, um, hand sketches to get the output is quite interesting. Um, to drive, if you're good at sketching, I mean, that's nearly like, you know, the way I, we, we used to work or you create kind of translation, uh, using hand gestures, doodles, and uh, verbal instructions to your team. <laughs> so that can, to some extent be, you know, that, that interlocutor is now um, some of these AI systems. And we obviously, this is the research team just finding uh, old sketches from we used to have from the office and from Zaha and so on. I mean, this is not really meant as to be project. This is more kind of research exploring what would come out if you have a sketch library and you're just feeding that in. And um, <clears throat> so my screenshot, depth, depth map, 
and then um, text prompts describing additional features, you get these kind of um, variations and uh, examples, etc. Okay, um, now the interesting part is also to there's different ways to fine tune models, different methodologies. Right, so stable diffusion is obviously is, is great because it's an open source tool. We have downloaded it, we're running it over our server, and we, we're training up different models. So one la quite larger general purpose upgrading of the model with our stuff. We do that. And then we're also doing these kind of so-called LoRa models, very quick, project by project, very small models, but very targeted for the project. And that's also very effective. So for each project, we're training up quickly a new model specifically. We could do that. And that's the comp com um, comparison. So, and what do we train this these models with? For instance, I mean, look, that's we don't mean that literally. This was just the, the research team needing material, going to our library. It's not that we want to recreate the 1980s. As a deed works, um, but just to show as an example, what you would, um, how do you have this kind of fine-tuned model, self-created model, what you can do with it, and even generate the output in 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 in, in looking like sketches and drawings. Um, I, there is a kind of faking. I'm not saying this is is. is please see that as a kind of research to explore tool possibilities and training up possibilities. And, and not yet super strategic. But then you can also I put output that um, um, painterly, uh, Zahadi painterly way onto the sketch model. Okay, of course, the exciting thing is always that you can have these kind of strange hybridization as well, this kind of where you bring two quite distinct and different things. And the, so that that's the you know, the way we often create, and you kind of hybridize or have free associations, kind of surrealist fusions. And that's one way of actually uh, generating something quite, I'm not saying it's a great design, but it's only something fresh and unexpected. But also the output, you don't always have to think of photorealistic, you can make it look like a concept model and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, now, what is what I'm saying is that kind of the the uh, dream booth, so-called checkpoint model. They're they're we building them up. They're very large, five gigabyte, for instance, with a lot of our material. And then these kind of low rank adaptation of large language models. I don't know. I mean, don't ask me about the particulars of the technology, but uh, these could be very very small models, like seventy five megabytes. Um, and you can um, run several in parallel, or you bundle them. In <clears throat> and the output, I'll show you some examples. So this is the way, uh, for instance, uh, a training up a model specifically um, with, so let's say we have done this project and we have already 70 renderings of this and now we have to come back and redo something and do a new, a new version or it was rejected, we do a totally different version or an iteration of that. So that is first training up, and that only takes 1.2 hours training up, feeding in these 70 renderings of this particular project. And then um, uh, tagging them uh, uh, with, with, you know, with what they are. So we, the realistic, photorealistic renderings come in, and the, we can also feed in diagrams and other things, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, we can go back and uh, generate this control net um, with this, which says water, greenery, skyline, building forms, and then it just generates that. And, uh, and then the, the black is basically left for later, and that is driven here by a hand sketch. I mean, this person, <laughs> and it wasn't me, can actually <laughs> sketch quite nicely. So then you get into, uh, with this setup, you can sketch quickly versions and get these renderings and options. I'm not saying that these are great designs or anything. I'm just giving you 
methodology which we use it okay and based with these LoRa network trained up models or here we have uh, we've done a lot of master plans uh, over the years so we have the advantage of these kind of great personal database private private database. I mean, it's not private. You can also go online and find a lot of master plans. But we have also, let's say, another hundred of lost competitions, which we didn't publish, and the whole archive. Um, and then, so we, 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 we generate this kind of urbanism, Zaha, Deed, Architects, Parametric Urbanism uh, kind of uh, network. And then, you, again, here you can see what we've done. Uh, we painting again what is water, what is built, what is green. And that is just quickly, there is an initial rendering of the site. When you hand sketch over where you want towers. I mean, this is a whole master plan. So, and that's the stunning thing here. So this is now designing a hundred buildings in, in a flash, using your own repertoire, using a bit of I, thinking of roughly sketching where you want towers, where you want uh, you know, uh, these horizontal buildings, there is this kind of inbuilt. Uh, so you could quickly give directionality, right, et cetera, et cetera. I think is that that's really credible, productive, and um, for, for, for churning through options and checking the legibility of the cityscape, the plausibility, the visioning, and so on. I mean, that's really stunning, I think, <clears throat> when it comes to filling such a site with 100 buildings. And then the next case here is quite interesting. So you can uh, calibrate how much that trained specialist model, how much weight this has in the, in the generation process versus just a generic, uh, let's say, stable diffusion city. I don't know how you initially prompted it, you know, uh, Barcelona-like waterfront city, blah, blah, blah. And then we bring in our model and we have this kind of uh, weight increasing and generating um, degrees of transformation. So you can see when the model recedes and less and less is of this model. So, and then it builds up again. And I think this is interesting for exploration again, or phasing strategy. So there's a whole. <laughs> um, anyway, so I think this is pretty effective and need need some neat tools here. Okay, so we go on. And it's, you know, clients are, uh, are spoiled. They want photorealistic renderings of every single thing, every time, and every interim presentation on you. And they want five options. And uh, so, so there's enormous productivity gains of, of that. But it's also inventiveness. I mean, you can't, it's not only you can draw it, you probably couldn't come up with a lot of this variation. So there's, there's real creativity here to bo a boosting of creativity. So parametric urbanism becomes the thing. So here's another one, a very particular master plan project, also in China, uh, training for hours with 80 prior images. Same thing in a different project. So, <clears throat> please have a lot of time for, you know, the decision making coming out of such a process, obviously, and, and it will always have to be fast. The overall process is maybe six weeks with three interims or so on. Uh, you get a much, much higher level of exploration of the, of the solution spaces. Okay. And this is, you can also develop your own graphics. So we have, in a way, in our firm, developed some kind of graphics over the years. Again, I mean, this is less important, but. Again, once you let the research team loose, they run with <laughs> different things. So as you can see here, you can make these master plans and we can kind of paint them in the style of and make these kind of painterly sketches of it. And sometimes this is, you know, uh, 
useful to have kind of diagrams as well as photolistic renderings, obviously. Um, okay. So uh, the other thing I wanted to show here, so um, we've trained up, and that's not our work, just other high, high detail photos of interiors taking out some of these furnishing companies. So, um, and then to generate a, a specific model catering for that. And then again, putting degrees to which this comes, this additional model comes in to support or to overpower, let's say not overpower, but kind of impact strongly onto the stable diffusion, large model. And then these are, I mean, they're unbelievably convincing. They're like photos. And I'm flashing them through. Of course, if you go closer, there's sometimes things that the three legs of a chair don't make sense. There, there's something which slipped off the axis. There's certain, it, it, it's not, you know, when you walk closer, when you look very closely, <laughs> you'll find something, but it's still, you have to admit that this is pretty, pretty out there in terms of um, generating compelling, coherently, seemingly realistic possible worlds of so and again yeah so back to which is a more serious and more interesting venture to develop the tectonism data set and network and and separating out and it's just the beginning the different uh, tectonic um logics as uh, etc and in a way you could and train it up and generate some kind of shortcut topology optimization nearly or learn that these and that's some student work AADRL topology optimization they're very, very different tools and then interpret them different if you they fit with these tools different tools whether the line tools versus the solid erosion tool they fit better with concrete or steel or timber etc so we have a we have a big archive of these and if you had to fill in a, a cityscape with, 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 say, exoskeleton towers, and of course the advantage of exoskeleton is the inside is freed up for panoramic elevators and atria and so on. Uh, I mean, that's something which, which is an ambition which you can't do with AI at the moment. And as I showed you, the AI falls short of this. And so that's one big project of development. And you can, of course, build other kind of forms of AI, not image AI, predictive simulations where you can shortcut um, uh, topology optimization, uh, fluid dynamic simulations, even our agent-based simulations. We have thousands of agents running occupancy simulations. They heavily computationally, and we could, uh, we can do it kind of statistically train up a prediction. What would be the, the, the heat map of occupancy the patterns in this space versus that space and you shift the chairs around and you get an, a super fast registration. So that's another kind of AI and they're more AI. By the way, what if, sorry, I wasn't talking as we, we see this. This is just it's a collaboration with, with Emmanuel Ko, which we're doing at the, at the uh, in Singapore University. Uh, but the bit which comes later is this kind of idea of going at a 3D. Of course, these are voxel clouds and not easily usable geometries, but trying to approach um, AI for 3D coherent objects, at least in the form of um, point clouds, or voxel clouds. Um, Patrick, thank you very much. I think uh, we're running a lot yeah, of... We are running, uh, you, 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 good reminder. Basically, that was it. So we're going you know, we have internal reporting, what are the pros and cons, what can we do with X, Y, Z, what is the outlook, what are we working on? Um, and we have this uh, research application and feeding back into research, etc. So yeah, that's where we are with ZH and AI. Thank you very much. That was super useful and very interesting. Thank you, Patrick. Yeah, my pleasure. Wait, I have to stop sharing, I guess. Great As we have been already here, a lot of us have been using some Great of the tools. 
uh, there is one of the questions I think that bothers most of the architects here in this hall and in general. Have you commissioned any of the projects so far that you've well, done already? It, well, not yet, but it, it's going to be quick. I mean, there's uh, stuff coming. Uh, you know, in China things go very fast, but otherwise, no, nothing built. None of our build works is, is, is part of that. Wait, hold on. And year. any competitions won? so far um yes i think so yes 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 there's some stuff ah oh, that's already a cool result i think that gives uh, <laughs> also hope, hope for the students and for the practicing architects a lot thank you very much for your time is there any question from the audience yes um uh, during all this parameters description, I don't see human. So when you describe a bridge, you don't mention how many people will pass through it, how many cars may pass. Or when you design a building, I don't see like how many people may use it, what kind of conditions they may use it. Um, is this not a um, parameter definition? Or how can we integrate this kind of parameter into the design of a social environment? Yeah, I'm not sure we're fully... Can somebody summarize this? You're talking about social environment. I think that's but... uh, about including human uh, there into into this architectural projects and especially with AI generated, like, um, let's say, flow of human and how they are going to interact, how they are going to use this type of perspective. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I can tell you uh, this image AI obviously is at the moment limited, in principle perhaps also l limited, in it, but it can be what we are working on, <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> we're working on uh, social process simulation or what I call life process simulation, particularly in corporate campuses, headquarters, universities and so on. And these are large agent models where the agent population is differentiated by team affiliation, by status, <clears throat> departmental affiliation, uh, and uh, whether they visitors or, or staff and et cetera. They, they also the networking between staff we can feed in. And we can therefore, we then uh, test different layouts and distributions of meeting rooms and social spaces and corridors and work zones in term and then try to figure out how many encounters we get between the various subgroups and measure that out and how many encounters are likely to convert it into communications because they happen close to a to a prop or situation where this is made likely and so on and so that is something we're doing it sometimes uses utility <coughs> ai from the gaming industry is another form of ai to, to simulate these decision-making processes and having agents with internal states and external stimuli and various targets and util, uh, uh, let's say um, utility functions and also the furniture when you make it kinetic can have try to maximize self-utilization in the process so these things are exciting and then you obviously have to marry that up with the generative algorithm to generate all these iterations you need to test and simulate and for that we're using machine learning so uh, where you have where you can target the generation of of these variants that they don't become random they follow a certain set of criteria and the machine learning algorithm they learn quite quickly to <clears throat> to maximize uh, uh, numbers of desks or permeability or or diversity of elements you and we, so then you have an evolutionary algorithm possibly and once you have a huge database perhaps one can feed that into an image machine as well and then uh, get kind of um, uh, good versions out if the if the noise level is dialed down so but again i think image AI is only one form of an, uh, artificial intelligence when it comes to the more serious evaluative analytic or the success criteria which we value not only visually, but in, in a kind of evidence-based and measured so social performance sense, there's other tools we, we will promote for that. But I still find <coughs> you know, 
we can gauge a lot from a visual scene whether it would it would work for a lively uh, social scenario and whether you'd find niches and points of discovery or places a diversity of places you would find inviting and credible <coughs> so i don't think you should underestimate <coughs> uh, you know base designing with images in any way even if you have a very rational design process you have to come out in the end with images to also test the phenomenology the tractability perceptual tractability the legibility of this through uh, images so that would be my answer to that uh, we are certainly i'm certainly very keen on um, <coughs> focusing and upgrading the discipline for social functionality <coughs> <laughs> measures and that's not so easy when you have a very complex society with multiple audiences and large public or semi-public places with a lot of roaming <laughs> uh, interaction situations so so we need ai in different in different ways not only image ai thank you very much um that's a good input because i think ai is uh, it's a gr great tool but it just appears and it's on the initial stage so we cannot work with 3d we cannot work with a lot of uh, parameters with the social parameters or with roads or something else but as a concept stage it's a it's an amazing thing and we're already slowly going to the drawings to the plans that's also cool and uh, can we use your library as well? <laughs> I'm joking, but uh, for the students, yeah. Thank you very yeah, no, much. There's also, I mean, uh, there's, I think that Revit and all a lot of tools will 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 upgrade with various AI. I'm mean, thinking you can already uh, the idea of loading up a lot of your special details, uh, drawing details, and have them uh, then kind of distributed in the right places in a drawing. And generating 2D drawings with, with enhanced detailing from a 3D Revit model, these kind of things are in the pipeline. So for for also sharing a lot of intelligence uh, within a large office or between offices as well, you can you can maybe put such a beautiful system on the market. And let's say it would be great if we could have on our fingertips all the beautiful, fantastic Richard Rogers, <laughs> yeah. superb details. Um, and then have them kind of deployed um, in our projects, etc. Let's see where we stand in one year. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you for your time. Thank you. With Patrick, it's also it's always uh, interesting how he is talking, especially in the beginning. You feel like I don't understand what is going on, but it's very interesting because he used to be my professor in university, and there was a lot of feedback when you sit and you actually don't know what next steps you have to apply now after this talk with your projects. But in general, as a concept development and uh, as a lot of theories and ideas, this is such a great input, and I'm very thankful that he participated now and give us uh, a perspective about how this happens in one of the biggest architectural offices. I would like to introduce the next speaker, which will be Maria Zalbruckner. She will be talking about the AI-supported software, about numerous inter interdis interdisciplinary design options, basically in the factory making and in general development, that you have so many perspectives that you have to think about, that you have to incorporate them, that you have to apply holistic approach, and how AI tools already can operate with that in reality. Okay, please welcome Maria. Okay. So thank you very much for having me tonight. That was, um, yeah, sure. um, that was, um, I think, not planned, but I'm still happy to be here. But thank you very much. So I'm going to introduce to you Factory Maker, the AI-supported outcome-driven industrial building design tool. So um, I want you to imagine to be standing inside of a factory, any kind of industrial building. And if you imagine to be in such a space, and um, I guess, in this setting, I don't have to explain too much of how many disciplines actually are working together to complete something like this image that I have just to help your imagination to put up on the slide here. Um, 
it is technical equipment planning, there is machinery going around in a factory, there's architectural elements that are coming from all of you, I guess, and there's production logistics going on, but there's also person working, there is material flow, information flow, all those kind of things are happening inside of a factory. And I think you can see, because those are just a few of the disciplines that have to work together to actually build and plan a factory, right? But I guess you can think of, if you think of the planning um, phases that we are having right now in our construction industry, you know how sequential it is, you know how fragmented it is. And this actually results because some of those disciplines come before, for example, I'm a civil engineer before my structural engineering, right? Some of them come afterwards. And this sequential planning methods results in those three big problems that it, we have picked out. So it's the information loss too to the sequential planning method. And we are getting through all these iterations that we have to do because of that. We are actually overlooking opportunities because we are rushed in the planning phases. And actually to do simulations that are interdisciplinary and that we can do all together, there are no tools out there to perform holistic simulations to actually de de support our decisions that we're making design-based. So what would be the solution? Would be to have a rapid software uh, that is integratable and accessible to interdisciplinary design teams um, that are planning together and to enhance them, to, to empower them to make data-driven simulations and variant studies. So and that's what Factory Maker actually stands for. So we are seeing a factory or industrial building as, a, as one entity, so where the building design actually always harmonizes with the operational strategy. So everything that's happening inside of the factory is affecting the building structure and every other discipline that is out there and the other way around. And therefore, we're building a platform where stakeholders, where building planners, where process planners, technical equipment uh, planning disciplines are actually able to fulfill their uh, planning disciplines or planning uh, steps through digitization, automating their manual steps, and also optimizing their plannings through the computa computational capacity that we have to nowadays, and actually enabling them to to plan more sustainable, future-proof, and also economic efficient f factories. Why are we using computational capacity for that? Why are we using AI for that? It is because the if you want to plan an integrated industrial building where so many disciplines come together, I guess you saw just some of the disciplines here. The solution space is huge. It's not linear, it's not quadratic anymore. We can't look at it anymore. You need to go further. So we are, uh, yeah, we'll try to solve this with generative networks. And um, yeah, that's exactly what I just told you, because we have developed something that I will show you in a minute um, already that is all based on evolutionary algorithms, and you just come to an end. We have 50, over 50 projects implemented into our current algorithm, and we have, I think, around 370,000 um, solution points that we're looking at when we're doing like easy projects, simple projects. And this is just at the beginning um, bringing together building planning and also process planning, right? There are disciplines missing that we are having not implemented yet. That's why we want to enhance our software with AI and also help to help us to integrate all these other disciplines. And we want to still keep the human in the loop, what we discussed right now, and get the user's interaction with the system and that's also helping us with the system, right? And we have these complex relations. We have an n-dimensional space, as I just explained to you. The generative networks are ideal for to capture and to map multidimensional relationships in large amounts of data space. And the automation, efficiency, and exploration, I think we all know about that, that AI or generative networks are helping us with this a lot. So this is what we're trying to solve. We want to have model-based input and or text and numeric-based and to just send it through a gener generative network with supervised learning, transferred learning, ranking the outputs and to actually get outputs that are model-based and also report-based for each discipline. And we don't want to become an island-based solution like it is nowadays in construction industry where you have this one software solution, you can use that, but then you're kicked out of any other. We want to be openly accessible so that you can actually export your files and use it in your work or discipline-specific software environment. And that's what we 
started to do already. We did this in a research project that comes from Teovin. We started this three years ago now, um, where we started with simple input regarding the oper operational processes and also the property and the building specifics that you want to, to look at. And we perceive the industrial facility, as I mentioned before, as the one entity. And those disciplines, the production process or process, process plannings and the building plannings actually are interacting um, with each other and impacting each other's designs. And we integrate the structural engineering and the production planning and give them real-time feedback for each automatically, automatically generated variant that is based on multi-criteria specifications. So how it looks right now is that we have property information and what I just told you before, process information and also about the building, some, you can put some preferences in. And then there's an automated generation of parametric models for process and structure and the automated structural dimensioning. It's like German Vorstatik, so we're like before Einreichstatik. And it calculates of each variant, the life cycle costs, the life cycle analysis, the flexibility and the recycling potential. By now we have 11 um, 11 measurements or criteria that are calculated by our, by our algorithm. And what you get out of it is a 3D factory building variant and also the automated evaluation and ranking according to the set criteria. So here you see the same in pictures. You see the layout process in the beginning, you see the building planning. You can use them separately by now, but it is supposed to be used integrated to actually see that those designs are coming together and then you get a rating for each design and you have a decision support through that because then it tells you what is the most sustainable, what is the most cost efficient variant. Here you have a short, oh, or it doesn't work. Doesn't work, I think. Yeah, so here you can see a short video of how our tool is actually working right now. So it automatically generates the building variants and also the production layout scenarios and then gives you feedback and you have like an output mask um, that is not really user friendly yet, but where you can see all the costs and the sustainability factors and all the flexibility rating and metrics that we implemented. Um, we have market feedback so far. We've done 15 projects and a bit more, I think. Um, and our cooperation partners um, told us, or we got to know that we are actually helping them to save 30% of, of CO2 emissions within their projects. We're helping them with 20% um, of cost savings and also 90% of time savings in the early design stages. We reduced our planning time from four weeks to two days. Why can we actually do this? So, um, as you saw, we have a research-based MVP, we have the domain-specific expertise, and we're actually having to prove that we're saving time and costs for the industry. Shortly through the market of the AI, I mean, everyone will know this here, the um, artificial intelligence market is rising every day that we're on this planet. And especially in construction, it's also very, very, I think, developing and, and enhancing quickly. So um, we have competition, we have other users, we have other tools that are being used, but the thing with us is why we want to be different or why we are actually different is that we want to be integratable into all those existing tools, right? We want to use them. We don't want to become the one single island solution as said before. Um, yeah, so that's why we're the game changer. Why Factory Maker actually, sorry, um, is not, it is an autonomous um, solution and software solution, but it is not an island solution. So you can actually use it in your current environment and just keep just performing better and improving your designs through using our tool. Um, shortly to our timeline, because I told you we started as a research project at TUV a couple of years ago. We are now about to found the company in the beginning of next year. Um, so we're going to be called a TUV spin-off. That's what you can do with your projects and research. And um, are going to release our first SaaS version that we're currently working on um, in 2024. Um, this is the team that is currently working on it. So it's my two colleagues, Julia and Thomas, and myself. 
Um, and we're bringing to the table expertise in engineering, mechanical, civil, architectural engineering, and also software and business development. Thank you very much for your attention. And last but not least, I just wanted to say that, oh, sorry, um, that we're actually looking um, for computational designers and software development developers. So if any one of you is interested or wants to have more information, just let me know. Wow, perfect, Maria. Thank you so much. That was my question actually to you. Do you hire? You know, you have such a amazing talents here, so maybe maybe somebody can come to you, you know. Take your business cards, take your contacts and perfect. Next speaker is Aisha Glass. Uh, she is an architect who was working a lot with acoustics before, who then later came to computational design, then to engineering, and was working with innovating, innovative digital tools and urban development since uh, about 30 projects already. And uh, her research spans uh, between the, the synthetic data generation, smart city applications, urban soundscapes, creation of intelligent designs and adapt to diverse parameters. Today she's going to talk about the smart cities and she was supposed to be here present but unfortunately she was booked to a very big symposium in Tokyo and now in Tokyo is almost 2 a.m. and she was so kind to hold her presentation for us online. That's why please uh, take your time and appreciation for Aisha. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, the program looks amazing. I would love to be there also. But I have like another two presentations, so time was not fitting. So that's why this time I'm not in person there. But thank you so much. Um, so I will be sharing my screen. And uh, could you please uh, allow me to share my screen? So I'm uh, a postdoctoral researcher in digital city science in Harvard University, Hamburg. And from the beginning of December, I'm also switching another project about the digital twin, a little bit bigger project. And it's about uh, uh, controlling the data over the digital twin and uh, also with the collaboration with the Deutsche Bahn uh, together with the flow management and also the fire plan optimization. So it is getting a little bit uh, wider, the future research direction. Uh, but today I will be explaining about what did we do in Daphne project, uh, my past project that is finalizing in three months and it will be open for everyone. Uh, we worked on more on the synthetic data generation for smart cities, for smart city use cases especially. And when we think about the smart cities, we define smart city per, uh, actually concept with the people inside because the citizens are judging the cities with their own satisfaction, with their own happiness. It's about the, how livable is the city, how well connected, how are the people connections, how it, it is well planned or another also attractions inside. So. When we start synthetic data generation topic for the smart cities, we try to focus on also a lot with the participation and the user perceptions also. So how did we actually uh, prepare our synthetic data generation methods is like, we are already in digital city science team that developing a lot of tools for architects and also for the urban designers, administration. So we are thinking about some problems or some challenges that are possibly better uh, with digital tools. And then we are preparing and we are checking some algorithms if they're already existing. Uh, if they're existing, we are checking how can we do it more, um, more uh, accurate or efficient. And if it's not there, we are checking 
different algorithms which would be possibly applicable. When we started that project, uh, that was the only uh, synthetic data generator tool that was ongoing development. Right now we have around 10, uh, it's getting every day more, uh, because last year when we started teaching about artificial intelligence and architecture, every week a new tool and a new development came. So I think we will be uh, a lot more exploring in the future also. Then, but why do we need synthetic data, especially we need it in the not developed places. So in the, if the city or the area in the city is not existing, it means actually we don't have data. So for exactly that use case is the most important use case actually for us, for the newly developed areas, we need a lot of times good quality of data sets to evaluate and then um, plan better cities. Also the other cases, a lot of times uh, the synthetic data is needed because we cannot reach the data. It is sometimes not possible to process it. It can be sometimes very expensive. So there are a lot of problems also with the privacy, security issues. So if we use the synthetic data for designing better places, then we can have actually better uh, design and accurate results from our simulation tools. So uh, that's why we are creating synthetic data and we are uh, training the models and then validating that uh, training. So Daphne was more uh, evaluating the methods rather than the data itself. So we explored different data sets and we prepared 10 use cases in the beginning and then they were getting a little bit more, but if we match them, actually they are uh, getting together a lot. They are focusing in the mobility. So these 10 use cases were movement in urban districts, tourist transfer to mobility centers, urban civil protection, hazard prediction, bridge maintenance, prediction and preventive management of air pollution, social dynamics, light and mobility, watering for the climate and city signals. We, as you see, actually, there are a lot of things about the connections in the city and the mobility. So we decided to focus on the two use cases. One is the mobility tool and other one is the maintenance. This is actually the how the project's uh, background looks like. So we actually, when, when we started the project, we thought about the more generic approach for the data because we thought if we can build up a data generation platform, which everybody could use and generically produce more data sets, then a lot of designers or users can have actually uh, accurate data sets. But when we experimented with the real data set, also the simulated data set, it was not like this. We really needed the use cases and specific use cases for the specific methods and the specific data sets. So that's why we didn't completely generically design the platform. We have a generic also tabular generation. For example, if you want to one day match the weather data with the, let's say the bridge maintenance uh, for the bridge conditions or the skyscraper conditions or any other uh, city element condition, then you could possibly use that generic tool with the tabular data generation. But for example, I will be explaining about the uh, a graph and the map generation and also the mobility tool, then uh, we will see that we also need a lot of use cases. So with the AI and the AI powered tools, actually architects and designers need now uh, more people in between also, not the data scientists and maybe not the designer directly, but in between is also very important. Also prompt engineering is getting uh, have getting every day more important. And we can, in my opinion, have a new page in architectural design or urban design through that digital tools. So these are our uh, approaches that we were concentrating on. One is the neighborhood generation. In that approach, uh, we took the data from the maps and then uh, we mixed it up the functions. We also asked some questions about the, how would it look like if we would generate the neighborhoods, for example, only for kids or only for women or only for men or only for taller people. So we asked this kind of questions and we thought if AI could catch some similarities or some patterns to generate new cities completely from zero from the existing maps. That would also give us 
uh, application area, for example, if we know a very good um, place with the happy citizens or very good mobility uh, connections, then we tried if AI can catch these patterns and if it would be applicable to another city or the places which are not so strong in the connection. Second one is RL, uh, which is a deep reinforcement learning method. So that method is actually a simulation tool working on the Python. So we were designing like the life, the conditions of life and everything happens, all the simulations are happening in the text files. When we are simulating and trying to understand the city, we are sometimes uh, playing with Legos, which, have, which are having QR codes, their um, touch points with the, our smart tables, and then we are simulating the city exactly like we are, how we are actually designing them. But in that tools, usually the agents which are presenting the human, they are usually going to the closer lunch, coming back, or they are going home always. They, they are not really re representing the real life. They don't really represent the very much differences. For example, it can be even a doctor is traveling in the city on a different level than maybe an architect or a child is different than a 17 years old. So an elder, elder person is traveling on a different habit. So we thought how to explore with the AI power all that habits. Can we find the connections which are generated by AI? Because this is what AI can do actually that can learn uh, from the simulations. So uh, we gave the index points on the points, uh, like the locations in the map, and then we measured the duration. We also prepared a survey and connected with the score system, the survey. So from the survey, we try to get a score system that we can apply to our algorithm. What does it mean? The score system is actually for our AI to learn. And in reality, if we give an example from the reality, for example, a child is waking up and let's say going to the kindergarten, daycare. And if the child is passing the playground, most likely we assume that he or she will be happier than if this child is passing the bar because bar is not really interested in the, in the city, the child. So if the child is representing that point, then we made higher scores if the child is going over the playground, we made less scores for the child if it's going over the bar. So we made the survey also with a lot of conditions, also a lot of um, possibilities and uh, scenarios behind. So we told people, please give yourself a score. Also, duration on the road. For example, if you are going to the reaching the hospital with less than half an hour, most likely we are happier than if we are if it, than it takes for us like two hours in between on the road. So every time when we were going to the hospital, if this point that is for us an index number is presenting a wounded person, then we told if the duration on the road is longer than uh, 30 minutes, one hour, two hours, three hours, we tried every possibility. And every time when it's longer, we gave minus point. This way, AI could learn through our score system for different scenarios and different personalities. This is the first approach, how it looks like. On the left, you see the ground truth and how the real map looks like, and uh, you will see the connection points. So on the right side, it's an AI-generated part. The project is still on the evaluation process, so we will be most likely in three months uh, opening that for everyone, and you can also test it by yourself. Uh, maybe you will also find um, your own uh, unique test results and it, it would be so nice if you can email me if you test it out and find some interesting results. This is the uh, what I told about our deep reinforcement learning tool. We, told, we called it motivity tool. So this way we try to find out the connections and the happier parts of the citizens. We also put some bonus questions for Hamburg, like what is the best place best that you love in Hamburg? What is the worst place that you visit? And so we will also try to match that data set with different other data sets together. As you see here, these points have different connections. And you, if you are uh, wondering how the survey looks like, you can check from the QR code. And on the background, this is a prototype that you will see right now. 
we manually played that game, uh, but AI is playing for every condition. So like we gave index numbers and then, then the duration on the road. And then again, the index number. Now you are in the 6.6. .6. Where do you want to go? AI is chosen one by one. So point one, it would be bar, point two would be home, point three would be park, and they have all different scores. And then the next step happens. So this way, because of the duration on the road and the duration on the uh, place, we can also follow up the day. And so this way we know also when the day is ending for one agent. And agent is for sure because it's nothing else than a point that we defined on the map traveling and winning or losing scores. That's why we can uh, just let it run uh, through and with the brute force method, try out every option in the city. Uh, last approach was the bridge maintenance. That one uh, is the for data fusion more. We were uh, getting the American data sets and exploring it. We, we are testing it out if it's applicable also for Germany. We are trying to learn the bridge conditions with that. And this is the tabular data generation. It doesn't have to be bridges. We are testing it out for the bridges, but in the city, we need to maintain and predict the conditions for a lot of other also uh, elements. That's why it will be applicable for other things. So it would be most likely the user can put the data set and get another data set, which is not including the privacy conditions of the individuals. What you see is right now uh, one step back. So this is a little demo video from my uh, PhD thesis. There also we were actually starting, this is more on, on an architectural level. So there we were starting also for uh, building up a concert hall, which can understand the needs of the instruments or inside the sound source. So for example, a rock band needs different needs than the acoustical needs and a different design than a violin player. So we thought if the space could be intelligent and go smaller or bigger or change the materials, what if it would look like? So we decided like, okay, we can solve it with AI. But in the end of the PhD thesis, we saw actually computation was enough good. So we didn't need it actually AI for any evaluation process for exactly that unique case. But still we produce a, a generated and design generation tool, which is working very fast. And also the method is just different. In that tool, uh, we could co collaborate during the design. So complete tool is, controlled by the code and we don't have any interface we don't have any modeling program a architect is giving the rules for example like i want to have let's say three panels ten, three to ten panels so the program is trying out three four five six seven eight nine ten panels and testing out in every generation step recording the results in an excel file so in the end architect can see the best or the worst conditions of the concert hall we also tested that approach. Uh, it looks like on the second steps here, define the rules and start the simulations. Architect is writing uh, or the acoustic consultant, what are the re results that are uh, wished? Or for example, if it's for the architectural students, uh, then they can see also in the milliseconds the, how the sound moves inside. Uh, another thing about that uh, computational design, actually, because we didn't have any program to download, it's just like 150 lines of code and every student can use it openly. Uh, so the program is trying out the different materials also on the walls and uh, also changing the model. So that gives also a lot of speed to the architect also, because what do we do in a lot of times we are using the already made programs, which, are, which needs a lot of computational power behind. So now with new kind of object oriented programming technique or the with ai on the top now also we have a lot of uh, further steps in the rendering design steps generation steps and all the other also automation tools here these are the real buildings that we built that that we could uh, really have a chance to test out that tool in the real buildings and once the hilton beaumont in istanbul some high-rise buildings, uh, there was a planetarium, uh, some art buildings, also the office spaces. These are the real buildings right now. So uh, that was working very well. Also, we can see through the AI uh, design interpolations. 
So this is a tool uh, developed by uh, I think in Delft University, if I remember it correct, uh, it is written on the source. And uh, from the shadow of the plant planning tool, we can uh, test out actually a lot of different interior plannings. And for us, what was important to see that process of the development of that tool, so every architect can have also their own design tools like that. As I told in the beginning, prompt engineering is also a very, very good tool right now for uh, exploring our creativity because every tool that we have in architecture or in uh, urban design is giving us a lot of times benefits. So uh, I think right now prompt engineering is a really important topic to explore for architects and for the designers because it has also a lot of beneficial points. And we will, I think, discover more and more about how to use this new design tool, which is called AI. For me, it's nothing more than a tool. And I think it's not in intelligent. We are intelligent, but uh, we can teach how to do things to that new tool. We have also, for sure, challenges, like in every uh, new tool. Uh, we don't know yet uh, how to also uh, regulate those, those uh, challenges, but every day I think uh, a lot of steps are going on. So the main challenge is for sure the data, but synthetic data can be a really promising approach to solve this, especially if it's developed for architects and for the urban design, and for sure ethical considerations, for example, algorithmic biases must be spotted. And uh, for example, we are, we are generating some visuals that you see also that visuals in my presentation right now and down there it's written which text we were giving and generating that we have still a lot of black box uh, process in between while generating why it is resulting like this in that tool and why not in the another one we are also comparing with the different ai tools our generation to see and explore uh, what are the new challenges and the new research directions so I'm coming uh, the, to the end of my presentation and uh, I can tell like we have a lot of things to do in the future. I think uh, I find it very exciting uh, that we can explore much more and through that tools, because they are getting better, we can drink more coffee. Uh, I don't agree with the stories that we will lose our jobs or something like that. I think opposite that we can present more uh, unique lives and stories. And also we can, I think, have our own magical powers through that digital tools in architecture and urban design. Uh, in conclusion, uh, generated cities and architectural design powered with the digital tools and AI, AI is quite promising. And I think uh, with the young architects, with the uh, young generation, I think, there will be even more things to discover because every time when my classes are getting younger, uh, they are also getting better in that uh, digital tools. So uh, I'm looking forward for the next years. And uh, I think also the, another big topic that we would like to discover is the human and AI interaction as a designer. And uh, our challenges about the data and privacy and all of the other things that I was uh, telling will remain but uh, there are also for sure a lot of exciting solutions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ahe. Uh, it was a great presentation and a lot, a lot of details. I think there it's uh, really better to have longer time with you to get into depth because so many topics and the city and the acoustics I think each of them deserve a lot of attention. But in general, I have uh, the last question to you. So um, you were working a lot with neighborhoods and with the cities. And do you think that it's already something that can be applicable nowadays or still it has to have uh, more of the research time? Your voice is coming uh, very much uh, hard to understand. Could you please repeat again your question? Maybe if I'm staying here, it's better yes, for you to yes, hear. Yes, oh, okay, good. Yes, yes. Uh, the question that, was... That is the acoustics. <laughs> yeah, okay. That is the room acoustics and the... 
Yeah. So Super. the question was about the cities and the neighborhoods that you've done some research. Do you think it's already something that can be applicable or still there is um, a need in a research there? Uh, I think it is. It, we need, still need a lot of research on this because uh, I think this new no neighborhoods, we, they, it gives us a lot. It can give us a lot of ideas and I think it is very good that we can right now get the patterns from the already existing well-designed areas and try to apply them in the newly developed areas. But still, um, I, architecture and urban design, especially in the newly developed areas, is some, something very, very, uh, we should act uh, carefully because the application can really cost a lot for the citizens and the users will, who will use there also for the builders. Uh, but still, I think I, sh I should say 50% uh, that we can be, we have really big steps that we can uh, see through the data of the other places and apply it through the synthetic data is a very good step already. But 50% still, uh, I will always give a chance that uh, it can fail in any digital system. Thank so you very much. <laughs> yes. Um, Thank you. Uh, that was a great presentation. Thank you. And I hope that next time probably we see each other in person. Yes, I would love to. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night <laughs> for me. <laughs> so we have amazing Manuel Mofidian that is going to talk about law ethics and biases in AI. Because Manuel have been working already since some time with the innovative companies, with startups, and he has been consulting people about how to work with new technologies. And AI is some of the topic that he really knows a lot. And now please welcome Manuel Mafidian. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. Thank you for this nice introduction. My name is Manuel Mofidian. I have the honor of um, having such great students at the TU Vienna. We're in this seminar, and I think when I began my first presentation about law, I was asking the students if they think law is uh, boring, and I, th I think some of you were raising their hands. I hope we changed that by now, and now we're trying to change that uh, also towards our um, uh, audience. Let's see if we can hold the high uh, measurements. I'm going to talk about AI law, ethics and biases. This is a topic I'm very passionate about because I think um, this is something we have to talk about now and not just in the future. And this is a part of my uh, presentation. Okay, um, so I have a question. Does anybody, maybe the lawyers, maybe Sasha, old friend of mine, know what these uh, legal areas have in common? Maybe also my law friends back. What is consumer law, IT, e-commerce law, and environmental law having in common? Anybody? At first? Yeah, I thought so. It's, uh, not, it's not being a... Sasha, do? Boring. Boring. No, that's not it, yeah. Uh, no, what they have in common, they are not AI law, but they are famous for being cross-sectional matters. They are not the typical uh, legal areas we learned at university. We started with civil law, with tax law, with public law. That's what we buy the books for. But consumer law, e-commerce law, environmental law have only been relevant for the last decades, right? And they came into our reality, in our facts of life, and they developed. And they have a lot of other legal areas uh, where they play a role in, right? So, for example, in consumer law, that starts with civil law. But nowadays, we have product liability law. We have also data protection law. The same goes for e-commerce law. Yes, it's partly online and distance selling law, but it's also warranty and consumer protection law, which we have before that. We have unfair competition law. We have telecommunications law. So these are cross-functional, um, uh, cross-sectional matters. And the same goes for environmental law, which partly is very, very public law driven. It's administrative law. You have constitutional law. But nowadays, uh, we have clients of mine here, uh, Optimus, and they are working on decarbonization. And so nowadays, we have decarbonization laws, which will also apply to companies. So those kind of laws are very interesting because they are not just um, uh, being one topic, but you have to keep up with them. 
And also those laws have something in common. They became regulated, highly regulated, because the legislature understood that those topics are very important. We like consumers, e-commerce, we love Amazon, but we want also to protect people who make online contracts. And the same goes for environmental law. You have big regulations and you have a lot of problems. <laughs> and you start and you see that some of those laws are, uh, play a role in different areas. And you have here the uh, public law uh, uh, topics, you have the criminal code, the, the Strafgesetzbuch. And so you see those um, areas develop and they never stop developing because life develops faster than law. That's just what it is. And I say AI law is of course also a cross-sectional matter, right? It consists of different parts. There is the AI regulation part, that's basically the main part, what can we do? What can we develop? What is allowed? What's not allowed? But we also have a lot of laws already existing, like data protection law, like liability law, like IT law, which I work with, because, for example, SIS law, software as a service contract law, will be hugely important when companies start developing business AI. And, of course, we have intellectual property law, another topic that I deal with. And I'm very, very excited about AI law because I think it's not bad, it's not good, but we should really think about it before it, it's faster than us. And we'll talk about this. So, what is the EU, what is Austria doing as a legislature to do this? <laughs> they are regulating. We know this from the GDPR. They love it. They make some papers and they try to explain to us how the world works. And what we see is that already in 2021, we had the proposal for the AI Act, but ChatGPT just came exactly one year ago in November. So we had something like that. We had an AI liability directive, and we also had the product liability directive, and the EU back then was already thinking about those things, but then what we see is there was a small adaption when ChatGPT came to the market. And what I'm going to try to do here is talk about real challenges that AI law will face once you understood what it is and we talked about that. Let's start with our challenges. Four challenges I talk about, that's dangerous AI, unbiased and next level AI, who is liable and the future of creative intellectual input, which will be interesting to our students because as of right now you're in, at university and you want to be paid for your creative output in the future. And Therefore, I don't want, to, I will talk about the law and how it works, but I will try to make it uh, touchable. That's always my approach. So let's talk about dangerous AI. Well, the EU understood some years ago there's something happening, there's AI in our products, we should regulate this. And once ChatGPT came on the market, the EU changed its approach really drastically and became more strict and started to do something to, to um, compartmentalize. Uh, uh, different topics and say we have minimal, limited, high and unacceptable AI and we want some of those AIs to be forbidden and we want some of those AIs to be highly regulated and some we don't care because it's not bad. And those rules, um, they um, uh, aim towards companies. But what are companies? They are providers, they are companies that develop AI, for example, uh, OpenAI but also Microsoft, but also deployers. And a deployer is basically anybody using AI except a, a private person just chatting with a chatbot. But also me as a lawyer, when I use AI, I'm a deployer. Also Maria, when she's working as an arch architect using AI, she's a deployer. So basically every business in the future that will work with those tools will be obeying European law unless it wants to be fined. And the interesting thing is the difference between high and limited um, AI, because with a limited AI, some say in Austria that's ChatGPT, because in the EU paper they talk about chatbots. But that's too easy for me, and I showed to my students some weeks ago that even some of the biggest law firms in their uh, presentations towards me as a paying customer trying to learn about AI law all the time say, yes, ChatGPT, this is a limited AI, that's not a problem. This would mean that they just have to be transparent and there are not a lot of rules they have to obey. High-risk AI is something different. High-risk uh, high AI is software, basically algorithm, algorithms, being built into certain goods, 
elevators, critical infrastructure, everything that's very important for people and where one could die. And every time you use AI on those subjects in the future, you will be in the risk group of high um, risk AI. And this comes with a lot of requirements when you develop it, when you use it, when you place it on the market, and of course, when you try to sell it and make business with it. So therefore, it is a very interesting question question, when am I high-risk AI and when am I limited-risk um, AI? The second topic, how you come into the, this, uh, in the, to the second uh, most strict um, class, is not just um, AI being built in certain goods, but also, and that's very general and sounds very legal, AI having an influence on certain areas. This is also something that became more strict in the ChatGPT adaption once we understood what ChatGPT could do. Because 2021, when we had the AI Act for the first time, we could read it, there, I think there was only one word um, mentioning chatbots. One, one word. <laughs> so when the parliament and the commission thought about this topic, they had no idea what chatbots could do and which power they have. So nowadays, we are a little bit more strict. We know probably, yes, certain goods, that's, that's important if you go into an elevator, maybe it should be very, very strict before you die. But also, algorithms um, working with AI, which can influence um, administrative decisions, which can influence education, uh, which can influence, for example, us teaching students. All those topics um, make AI software very fast, high-risk AI, and make a lot of rules for us once we do this business. So this is how we try to control dangerous AI once AI itself, that's maybe in the future, but I think if you watch the news for the last days, especially today and yesterday, that's not that unrealistic, it's theoretically possible. And people using AI. This is the first thing we try to control, first challenge that AI law will have. The second challenge is unbiased and next level ethical AI. Just today I had this idea to call it like that. Mm. Thanks. What do I mean by that? I think Maria, you were uh, mentioning uh, biases of AI and also Shana, one of our students, who has a technical background took one of the to topics that I'm very interested in and researched on bias. And what came out, there's a lot of bias in AI. And I think you learned about it today. It's not really the AI who is bad. It's a reflection of us. But if we don't want it to be extrapolated into the future and to change every, every one of us and to have such a huge impact that we become unbiased, we should think about this topic. And then there's something I call next level ethical AI. And this will be probably special of special interest to all of us. So to AI biases, I'm just showing some of the scandals that happened already. Google Vision, for example, misidentifying dark-skinned people, saying they are criminal because they are based on some statistics, which of course are not weighed, like statistics when Maria researches at the university or some guys of you, where we just don't just work with numbers, but we ask behind also. Why are these numbers like that? This is something that AI today can do, and therefore some scandals happen, and that's something we will work on. And then, something I call next level ethical AI. When you go to legal university, basically the first thing you learn, ethics is not law. Both are important, everything coming from legal philosophy, but whilst law is hard, law are rules you have to obey, and the state in a democracy will come to you and say, why, don't, why are you driving too fast? You get a, a fine. Why did you kill this person? Ethics is different. It's not irrelevant. If I'm a bad person to my friends, they will also tell me, Manu, you're ethically un incorrect in the realm of our friendship, but the state won't do anything. I'm maybe just a not likable person. You don't want that, but in the end, it's different than law. And I think especially AI law, other than a lot of different... Um, legal areas has a strong connection to ethics. Why? Because legislation takes time. We just saw the AI Act, it's not even in force. It will be maybe in force in two years, in three years, and the question is, can we wait that long? And therefore, it makes sense to think about these topics now and not wait for the parliament to decide something. 
Um, and there is also some, there are some movements in the industry where companies are binding themselves already because they understand what kind of topic we have here and better control it before. And then also the rapid development of te technology. This thing is getting bigger. I just listened to uh, the other uh, researcher having the presentation. I don't like people uh, being that strong opinionated. No, we will always have work. And the other side is, no, this is taking over jobs. We don't know. It's scientifically not provable what will happen. One thing we know, people are bad with statistics, really, really bad. And one thing we know, exponential curves are crazy. So we should really think about um, taking ethics serious because usually ethics become law. Usually we vote in the parliament and we have values. Somebody is conservative, somebody is, is progressive, and we vote, and then we make law. Therefore, seeing the rapid development of technology, I really think it makes sense to talk about what do we want AI to be, what is okay for us, because one day those ethical questions will, be, um, will transform partly into law. That's why ethics and law is a very, very important synergy, especially with AI. And to, to explain those principles, I want to talk with you about a theater play from the attorney from Germany, Ferdinand von Schirach. He's also a, uh, writing books and also making theater plays. Maybe somebody wrote a story from him. I know my mother likes him. <laughs> and he has a um, theater play that's called Terror. And there he is asking the question, how did an AI, an AI officer not, an officer, um, decide if he saves an airplane with 150 people or if he saves the Allianz Arena where Bayern Munich is playing a home game as of right now. And the officer decided against uh, his uh, hire, the person working uh, uh, above him, I'm going to save the 5,000 people, 50,000 I think they are, um, I'm going uh, to uh, shoot the plane and those people will die. And he did that. And then Ferdinand von Schirach in those theater plays, which took place in actual courtrooms in Germany and Austria. I know one of the uh, attorneys that played a role, she's an actor. Um, he asked the people, who, what, was he now guilty or not guilty for killing 200 people? And I'd like to make a small um, experiment. Who thinks he was guilty or not guilty? Who thinks he was guilty? Yeah. Okay, four people. Statistically, we come basically to the same uh, uh, result that we had in Austria. In Germany, it was, I think, 89%. Um, and we see some people react and say, well, he killed some people, right? And there I want again to emphasize on a principle in our law, not in ethics. Every life is uh, valuable the same quantitatively. So one person is as valuable like five persons. It sounds crazy, maybe to some of you, but it's like that. You cannot say, okay, I shoot this person to save five persons. It is illegal. And also every life is qualitatively the same. You cannot say one person is disabled, one person is older, it, she will die soon, the other person is healthy and I want to save her. No, that's not how our law works. This is not the, uh, the way how it goes. And now one could say, well, Whatever, I mean, when in life will it be that I have to save a plane um, to, um, and kill 5,000 people, right? That's not very often. But we have real life situation where we have to decide. And one example, for example, is self-driving cars, right? So we have friends in California from the startup scene. They are already driving in California. They, uh, they know this. This is reality. This will come in two, three years. Believe me or believe anybody, and we will have these questions. And the, the, an the, the, the problem is we have no answers to these questions because legally, when you kill somebody at a certain point to save another person, you don't go to jail, you don't go to prison because maybe you killed somebody, okay, maybe you're not justified. That's like a, le uh, like a legal test you go through. Have you killed somebody? Yes. But was it maybe justified? Was this person attacking me with a knife, and then I was defending myself with my bare knuckles and I killed him immediately. Then I can be justified and I don't go to jail, though the legislator says don't kill people. But then there's another level where we say we're all humans, right? People make mistakes, we have situations where we just decide. And for example, this case that we know um, with, the, with the airplane, this person, it was 
basically um, a murder. It was not justified because he did not protect his own life. He decided between different lives. But he was not guilty. In German we say, er hatte keine Schuld. Why? Because we understand that persons in real life sometimes have to make the decisions and they're not always perfectly logical. And even in our law, we don't have answers to it because we know one life is not uh, less valuable than five are. But those questions, they are very interesting when we start programming AI to make such decisions. We have, to, as a programmer and as legal people, to tell them, look, when you drive on the street and you see two people here and one, uh, one, two persons here and one person on the other side, we tell you what to do. Because AI is so much faster than we are and we cannot just say in the aftermath, okay, it was like a stressful situation. And this is a very, very interesting topic that we have never solved in human history because we never had to, because this just happens once in a while, that somebody kills one person in shock but, uh, to maybe save another person. And to show this, how hard this is, I want to make a small experiment and I asked my students just one hour ago. Um, and I want the first experiment we had already, right? We asked who would uh, kill the persons in the plane or not. The second experiment I want to ask my students to come out, please. Where are they? Robin, can, maybe some of you, and Shana. Can you all guys come? Because I want to let you vote. Yeah. Nobody will judge you and you're not doing anything illegal. <laughs> That's, yeah. Okay, come, come. Okay, so we have you. And then I would like to ask, yeah, come here, yeah, mehrere. Magst du auch kommen? Also ich, uh, the more the better, right, really, yeah? Okay, uh, and then I would, uh, is Maya prepared? Okay, then come with Maya. That's my friend Agnieszka, I know her from the, for 15 years and I studied law with her. And we are going to ask our first question. And I'd ask to my mother, would you come? Mama, come. Du musst nichts sagen. You don't have to say anything. Come. Uh, let's do this. And you have to go to the one side. Thank you. You too. And then we have the pitiful victims. Mama, come. We want, we want to execute the decisions. Come on. Okay. Now we have the second experiment. Yeah. And we will have, we will ask. So, you guys, if you would have to program the AI, um, would you save Maya, a beautiful and intelligent small child, or would you save my mother? P please go to one side. <laughs> and it's no joke, it's no joke. Let's do it. So, would you, it's totally fine. I won't grade you bad if you. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'll count, yeah? Maybe 10 seconds. Decide, yeah? Yeah. D which side? Do you go to Maya's side or my mother's side? Should we go there? Yeah, to the one side. Yeah, do it, do it. It's just Maya, it's not Agnes. <laughs> okay, so you've made a decision. First experiment. How, oh, it's wow, it's uh, six four. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. Okay, now the, the first one we have already, I know this. So, Steve, no? Okay, yeah. Oopsie. Are you grading now? No, no, I'm not grading. It's finished. I am actually, this is what I'm not doing. <laughs> So now the second, this was, I think, how, guys, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, six to zero. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Uh, six to zero. Okay. Now the second experiment, I think, gets a little bit harder. Let's save you. <laughs> Come here. Okay. Now um, let's uh, take maybe two persons, like myself, I, I think we have a good emotional connection, so this is going to be harder, I think so. And maybe three of my friends, would you join? Maybe ihr drei da hinten? Could you stand up? One, one is my client, come on. Yeah, yeah, come. <laughs> Second. Okay, the third expert. Yeah, and let's see, now we have one person, it's a child, but also, du kannst rüber? But, but now four persons on the other side and you have to program the next Tesla. How do you decide? You have 10, minute, 10 seconds. Decide who to save. Yeah, a child or four people. <laughs> yeah, decide, it's okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, you have to make it, it's totally, you just prove a point. Okay, now we have five to one. So. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> And maybe the last experiment we can uh, just describe. So, Robin, you stayed on this side. 
what if we would change it to being a stadium of people? Would you change your place? I, yeah, I would change my place. Yeah. Then do it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> totally fine. Or you won't be great. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> so, it's zero to six. Thank you guys a lot. Thank you for the experiment. It's awesome. We did not plan this, I swear. I was just asking the students if they would be prepared for a small experiment. And uh, they did not know anything. It really went perfectly. I did not think it would be <laughs> so nice. Um, you see how people decide and all decisions were right. But the question is, what do we do in the future? Is it five to one people? Not the, the decisions now, but how do we weigh this? That's very crazy. And one thing we know is the European Union is working on a, let's say, human-centric approach. Yeah? They try to mimic humans in those decisions, but they won't be able to because software does not work like this. But you see how hard ethic becomes when we talk about law. Good. Now, a very legal topic, but I'll keep it short after running. Who is liable? Uh, we have a uh, tort law, damages law, basically uh, regulating cases when somebody damages me. Uh, can I get money from him or can uh, I get back what he destroyed from me? And here we have some uh, regulation. Those are the ones that we saw, the second and the third line. And I just two, two, three words to it. What the EU is planning, they want to change our national tort law. They want to give us homework as national states connected to AI. One thing they want to do is um, to go into the topic and say, okay, if something happens with AI and we don't understand it, how can it be on the damaged person? In this case, we want to change a little bit the rules. Let me say it like this. Um, if something happens, we would assume it's the fault of the AI or, of course, of the AI programmer or of the company using the AI. You can, of course, prove it's not like that, but it is a little bit a, an exception to the general rule that the person having a damage has to show that the damager was not um, being co um, compliant with the law. He was driving too fast, he did not look out, he was drunk, things like that. And so the problem with AI is we don't understand it and we can, cannot show the mistakes of the programmers of the companies. And this rule is getting a little bit twitched if you want. And the other topic is the Produkthaftungsrichtlinie, it's the Product Liability Directive. And this is already very, very unmodern and old because they still just talk about physical products. They have no, they had until now, they never thought software is a product. So when something happened and somebody was harmed, they were like, yeah, this law does not count, we cannot do anything. And especially now with AI, they really uh, turn and start understanding that AI and software is something that can be uh, that it can be broken, can harm anybody, and then the rules of this Produkthaftungsgesetz we have it in Austria applies and can give you also money back or if somebody is hurt in your family, goes to hospital. These are the points I want to make, but what you again see is those are proposals of 2022, and then we don't know when these proposals will be really, really decided on by the parliament, but what we know already is we will have a six years review, review period for a five year review period, so this will take so much time until this comes. Therefore, we see once again, <laughs> law can be very slowly. And the last point, the last challenge I want to make that's also interesting to all of us is, what is with the future, what in the future happens with creative output, with things that only humans can do, right? Well, that's a very interesting question. And the one point I want to make is a work is something somebody created and when you have certain, when you meet certain prerequisites, you, you check the boxes, then it's your work and it's protected. And for example, this beautiful picture with the cars, I made it. Today, when I was preparing the presentation, I prompted into DALI, make a picture for me showing how uh, the automotive industry will change once uh, self-driving cars hit. This is the picture I used in one of my challenges. And the question is now, is this a work in the way of copyright law? In German, we say Urheberrechtsgesetz. Or is it nothing? Is it just something that I do? Well, let's test it. For to be a work under copyright law, you have three things. The intellectual creation, it has to be unique and it has to be expressed in certain areas. The intellectual creation, it's boring. We can already stop with the AI questions because it says it has to be an intellectual creation by a human being. It cannot be a monkey. We had one uh, case at the Supreme Court where a monkey 
draw a beautiful picture, and people wanted him to be the creator of this artwork. No, that's not working. So intellectual creation, it has to be a human being. Does it, it has to be unique. For example, if I just go and uh, uh, draw now a house just like that and say, well, this is, this, is, this is my artwork, I did it, people would say anybody can do this. That's not unique, that's not special. It has to have a, a speciality. Uh, um, the courts are saying it does not have to be the highest of art, but you have to see the connection between the creator and the artwork. And this is uniqueness. And then it has to be um, expressed in certain areas, music, um, uh, literature, uh, pictures, and film. For example, people drawing beautiful uh, paintings, that's clear. But also I, under the um, uh, copyright law, I'm kind of an artist because I write contracts, and contracts are also being protected under copyright law as long as they come from person, they are unique, my contracts are unique, um, and they are expressed in certain areas, and this would be <laughs> literature. And another area which is very, has been very important in the last year, uh, last years, is, is also, um, um, of course, software code, and also software code, we have some software developers here, is also an art piece of literature. So if you code something, and it's your creation, it's somehow unique, right? It's not just welcome world, something like that, hello world. It's going to be protected under copyright law. And this, if you understand this concept, it opens a very interesting challenge. Now, what about if, if something gets created and we see the artworks as of right now with the help of AI? Well, let's talk about it. Um, is the AI itself maybe the creator who can have these protection rights, can make money out of it, can forbid other people to do something with it. No, because it's not a person. Maybe laws will change, but as of right now, it's not that. Is it the programmer who programmed DALI, for example? Well, if we talk about the picture that I did, definitely not, because that's not the art piece he did. He's maybe a creator in uh, connection to the code he coded. This is protected, but once I used his code to create my paintings, he's out of the game. He's not, he's not part of it. He, cannot, he can be a creator for his code, but not for my picture. Can it be the AI trainer? Who is this? Those are the persons that put data into AI algorithms to make it good. Well, they may be creators, but again, other creators, because we have in Austria um, uh, one paragraph that says, if you train a data um, base, you can be the creator in this sense. So, the answer is maybe, but not of my picture. Can it be the AI user? Can it be the person? Yes, it can be. But you have always to have this unique uniqueness. You have to have some input to, to, to show, um, this is me, I created this. This is a lot of brain power that uh, ran into this project. And if you cannot show this, nobody will be the creator of this picture. And in my case, it was a prompt with seven words, right? So in this case, AI users that want to create art pieces that are protected, they have to give a lot of energy into it and some legal scholars and attorneys working with this say, for example, if you write a film script, yeah, if you just say make a film about two guys in Toronto, that's not going to work. But if you shape the AI and say, this is this person, please uh, uh, let me explain what he's going to do. If you, if you give some intellectual power to it and you generate a film script, you may be the creator under copyright law and may have all these rights. So, I think we talked about some of the challenges that AI law will have to face. I hope it was not too boring, and I thank you for your uh, listen, <laughs> listening. Thanks. Thank you, Manuel, very much. Uh, I think we are a little bit running out of time for the discussion panel discussion that we were planning to have before. Therefore, if you have any questions to Manuel regarding law, or if you have uh, any cases, uh, you have his contact details, and uh, please uh, come to him. So, any questions about... Yes, please. Um, my uh, question would be about, like, in a world that choose um, 10,000 kids' life against 10 100 hostages, how can you justify then law anyway that we are not applying anyway? So we develop a uh, law and we don't apply it anyway. So somebody can say, I'm going to kill 10,000 kids because there is a 100 hostage somewhere. 
and then since this law is not also legitimate, how can law is sometimes losing against uh, ethics? And sometimes it doesn't, sometimes um, law can lose against ethics because it has less power, obviously, on the world. <laughs> yeah. So how would you then describe, if you don't have even apply law in the world, how, why should AI should be different? Yeah. Uh, are you referring to a real life situation when you talk about 100 kids with 10,000? There's something current? Uh, or, or random question. Okay, I don't know which law you're referring to, but it seems to be an international conflict. International law is very, a, a lot of politics. Uh, I'm not an expert in international law, but uh, I would say in, the, in real life, uh, most of the time in human history, international law was was uh, got broken, right? So it did not, but I'm not sure about your case, which law you are talking about, because this is just anything, this is an opinion, and maybe true, maybe not true, but I don't think the law is out on this topic. It's, you are talking about a, um, let's say, philosophical, political, uh, uh, ethical standpoint, but that's not law. Law may be some charters, right? And we'll see about that in the future, but that's not what I meant. And the other question was um, about the, uh, Ethics loses against law, right? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Right, that's actually, you're making my point, right? Um, we can talk about ethics all day. Uh, let's say international is very ethical, very special. It's politics. Yeah? Let's stay in a state. We can t t talk all day about ethics and say, this is ethical, this is not ethical. If you meet a conservative person with strong uh, uh, religion beliefs, it will say, of course, uh, children have to go into school into religion classes. It makes so much sense. You will find another person saying, that's not ethical. Let them choose when they're uh, um, old enough. So I want to say, starting to say ethics lose against law is already getting into the ethics game. And maybe if you vote in the future in one state, not in, a, in the whole global world, you can change what law will be when you put your ethical beliefs into the parties you vote for. Okay, some more questions. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I want to ask about that fourth, uh, fourth point, the future of creative intellectual output. In those um, four, um, and, uh, actually, um, parameters, I would say, uh, one is missing. Uh, according to my opinion, because uh, artificial intelligence is using data. And what if the data is my creative uh, product? Let's say I'm, I'm using the pictures of Picasso. What happens there? Uh, I think the, that will be the fifth one, maybe, <laughs> here in, in that list. Do you think so? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a very good and relevant question, right? This is a question, and I have to be honest, I cannot answer as of right now, because I'm a lawyer, and I can tell you what I think should be the case, but we have no uh, case law, and also no laws on this, um, how to decide this topic. This is the question of taking data from other artists and using it, right? And so we have some laws dealing with the topic. If you take art from one person, change it somehow and then use it as your art. There are certain rights that the original uh, artist have, has to be named, to decide maybe in which direction uh, this, the, the new art is used. But this is, a, a, I'd say, a gray area. It has always been, because I think all of us or some people know art uh, coming from Manfred Dykes and then being used in a similar way, but with new art pieces. And I think this is one of the most interesting questions if legislators will change the rules how in copyright law. Because what you are pinpointing to is exactly the, the most interesting point is this AI scrapes the internet and takes art pieces. It's definitely not uh, being the artist, but in the end, maybe somebody using the AI is making new art. And this is an open question, and I'm uh, eager to see what the courts will decide. Thank you. Thank you very much, Manuel. And we are heading to our last presenter, but not the least. And uh, this is going to be Fabian, and I hope it pitch Pichaida, right? The the surname you you know that's your Pichaida, yeah, that's your client. Uh, so Fabian has been initially 
from TU, as far as I understand, and he has founded, co-founded a company, Optimuse. They, ha they are doing, they're working in real estate uh, development and they're working a lot with the decarbonization point. What they can do, sometimes you can see that it's just like a magic, but he will explain what is actually a magic behind that. And my word is coming to Fabian. Please greet him. Thank you so much. Well, um, after having discussed the life of children, we now uh, move on to sustainability. And uh, one of the biggest questions uh, out there is, can we afford sustainability in real estate? That's a question that our um, clients ask themselves. Um, and um, today I'm going to tell you why that is the case. If you now, if you look at buildings, buildings that have been designed, or what you do here at Architecture School, uh, you design buildings and then build buildings. But buildings uh, after that go out in reality, and then we have them there um, in our cities, in our countries. And the big issue with that is that a lot of them are not sustainable. So, a lot of buildings that we are that we are like this one we are in today may not be so sustainable and the question is how can we decarbonize these buildings and uh, if you want to pinpoint down the the issues with that is uh, basically there are three issues one is cost pressure you have rising inflation, uh, interest rates, and so on, that makes it quite difficult to go ahead and do measures for the decarbonization. Second one is time pressure. You under, if you want to adhere to EU regu uh, regulation, you have to go ahead and um, rebuild your buildings and upgrade your buildings. And last one is missing data. So there is not a lot of data out there. Uh, there are not a lot of plans and so on. So we want to help solve this process, uh, problem and therefore our vision is to expedite the transition towards more compliant and sustainable buildings. And now I'm going to show you actually what we do. Um, so starting with um, four simple questions, um, we then uh, we can generate a 3D uh, building um, or 3D model of a building out in reality. These models are not only um, completely uh, digital and 3D, but they are also uh, added with a lot of semantic uh, data that we can use. For example, each uh, window is declared as a window, and therefore we create a um, digital twin. And to do that, we use information like uh, satellite imagery, uh, uh, pictures that are recognized, and uh, also um, plans uh, layers. In a second step, you actually want to understand how is this building actually doing? Is this a building that is worth investing in? Um, how much emissions do uh, this building create? And uh, what is the overall um, energy intensity created? And therefore, also CO2. To do this, uh, we perform thermal simulation on these buildings. So complete uh, um, this, the, what the digital thing that's then simulated. Um, and so we can find out how uh, much energy is there to be used. And the last step is then you want to see into the future. And seeing to the future is always a bit of an of a interesting topic. Um, you want to understand what measure could you do and how much is this measure going to cost me and what is the gain out of it in terms of uh, energy um, reduction but also CO2 reduction. Often one measure at, uh, alone is not enough, so you want to build a strategy on how to combine these measures and also not only, only the combination but you want to know how much you're going to end up paying for it because at the end of the day someone will uh, pay for all these measures. So um, you see we are creating a tool that is a combination between uh, an engineering tool and a finance tool um, to un better understand your portfolio. And you can do this on one building, but you can do it this uh, on hundreds of buildings. And the benefits are like 
you have a gain in efficiency, so you're quite much faster, and you gain insights that are not there, wasn't, were not there before. Um, risk management and compliance. Uh, if you have to report towards uh, EU or other like banks, for example, have a lot of requirements um, they have to report on, uh, you want to be on the safe side of things, and now you're able to take data-driven decisions, where to invest and when. Uh, so yeah, that's more or less it. In general, and today I want to give you a bit of an insight uh, about how we do it, uh, because Manu made me do it. Um, so creating these models is not exactly easy, uh, because um, everyone is... Uh, uh, knows uh, Google Earth, but Google Earth um, or Google services cannot be accessed and uh, you are not allowed to access this. So uh, our lawyer would say, don't do it. Um, but then we have to come up with another, uh, another approach. Um, and it's quite difficult to get all the data to create a, m a model like that autonomously. And so uh, that is one, um, one use case we have for AI in our company. And uh, just to get the windows right uh, in the model is, uh, yeah, is a challenge by, uh, uh, by itself. The next use case we have is um, our clients normally have, uh, I don't know, around 100 to 300 buildings or more. So you want to understand the information they can provide because they normally don't have a lot of information and information can vary. So you need to assemble all this, uh, this data points you get and create um, actually the inputs you need to start um, with all these buildings. That's another use case. And the last one is not 100% AI, um, my dev team would kill me uh, for saying it, but it's multi-objective optimization. Uh, that's also a quite interesting technique to when you have a lot of buildings, um, where to invest and which, how, uh, which, how much money to get the, the, to get the low-hanging fruits and to get the most out of your portfolio. That's another use case we have um, currently, currently working on. So, um, yeah, to come to a conclusion, um, we are <clears throat> analyzed um, more than 200 buildings uh, for our clients, working more with 12 of them, and we could raise uh, around 2.2 million um, public and um, private funding. We have the first patent, which is also towards IP. It's, it's a hobby of mine to write patents. It's not so pleasing though. Um, yeah, and out in the, um, uh, now getting um, reviewed and hopefully soon, uh, yeah, granted. So yeah, we are a highly motivated team uh, based here in Vienna and you can see a lot of them are from the uh, Vienna actually. Um, yeah, exactly. So thanks you so much for listening to me and uh, if you're seeking for a new job or a job after university, uh, get in contact with me. Thank you, Fabian, very much. Hey, don't go, don't go, please, because there might be some questions to you. Is there any questions from the audience? Okay, you can skip. No, I have, a, I have a question to you. I have a question. So once you build this building that you estimate that's supposed to be there, I think it's based on the height, based on the approximately f amount of floors or something like this. Um, can you estimate also, for example, the heating systems and the materials and everything like this? And what, where do you get this information from? This is just an estimation of the surrounding and of historical information, or how do you gather these specifics of the building? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you, so multiple people have tried to approach this question, uh, this, uh, this um, question by looking at the surroundings, but often it's not so easy because uh, each and every building is uh, unique in its own. So we have to go down, create these buildings that are actually BIM models, a light BIM model, and then going and simulate them with uh, thermal simulations. So you can find out how much energy 
am I using today? To do that, you need like uh, all the materials, um, what are, uh, type of uh, windows do I have, and so on. But also, you need technical systems in buildings. Uh, so, how do, how do I heat today? How efficient is a system today? And uh, if I exchange this uh, system for another system, what is the gain? So there is a lot of engineering that goes into this, um, and we the data is gathered from different sources, but uh, we try to insource as much as possible because, um, yeah, yeah, it's a mess. There is not a lot out there, to be honest. Okay. Thank you very much. I think this is a very useful tool. And I would like to say to you one of the announcements because we reached our time limit and I guess people are already getting a bit tired and they would like to go home or for a party. Therefore, we would uh, reduce our symposium by one step. We won't do the panel discussion. But if you have any type of questions, we're still going to have a small coffee break here with some of the snacks, with some of the mandarinas and very nice Christmas mood upcoming. You can join, you can ask your questions to the speakers uh, right here. And I'm super thankful to all of you who have been here, who contributed to our amazing students. Each one of you made amazing project. Don't be offense that we didn't choose your project or something. It was a very hard decision because it was like a lot of cool work. And thanks everyone who are interested in topic of AI. I think that's one of the most important upcoming tool that we have to know how to use, what can be the problems there and how to probably tackle and live together with it. Thank you. I'll keep it short. Thanks to all the people involved in the organization, also to you guys. Thank you to my associates and employees who supported me in preparing the presentations. Thanks to friends and guests who held lectures here. They are all very uh, busy persons. Thanks to the students who were brave enough to come step up here and uh, present um, their uh, their work. That's not easy, especially in that age. I was stuttering at your age. I was <laughs> worse. Um, and thanks for the interest. And I hope uh, all of you got uh, different perspectives on this very, very relevant and future in the future even more relevant topic. And let's keep it going. Let's understand the importance of this topic and let's stay connected. Many thanks.